Welcome to another episode of Edge Grip Podcast. Uh, we have a very special episode today. Uh, you know, Nabil, how we always kind of complain that motorcycles are going away and Gen Z doesn't ride and we have to, uh, we have to bring people back to motorcycling. Uh, and, and along comes Eichma, and all of a sudden, everybody's got a new bike. So uh, I, I think the, the news about motorcycles being dead are, are a little bit premature. Uh, and if you pay attention to the market, you'd see that there's maybe 20 or 30 new models that, that they just presented, which is unbelievable. Uh, and we wanted to uh, take an episode and, and just go over uh, all the new models that, that are in the market. So if you are in the market for a new motorcycle, stick around uh, because we're going to have uh, pretty good information for you. Uh, and, and you know us, we don't, we don't do things halfway. So uh, we got a real expert today. Uh, we got maybe, I want to say, the fastest journalist around. Is that, is that a, a, an accurate description? I mean, I mean, he does hold the the record uh, for Pike Peak, uh, and that record I don't think will ever be broken because they don't race motorcycles over there anymore. But if if you're just going by the facts, this is the fastest journalist on earth. Um, so his name's Renny Renny Skabrook. Hi, Renny. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take that intro. That was quite nice. But uh, I don't think I'm the fastest guy, but, but I'll take it anyway. Thanks, mate. <laughs> so, so Thanks Ren- for joining us, Renny. Yeah. So, Renny is not only uh, the road test editor at Cycle News, uh, which I hope you guys read because it's it's really the best, I think, free content out there. Yep. So, yeah, we've, we've been free for, well, since we went PDF magazines back in 2010, plus there's the website and all that stuff. So, yeah, we, we, we're kept busy, I can tell you that. <laughs> And, and not only that, Renny is, is a journalist. He also, like I said, did Pike's Peak, which, which he set the record, uh, but he also did the Isle of Man TT. Uh, and you compete also in CVMA, right? Yeah, I do, but uh, maybe my racing days might be coming to an end. I don't know. But, uh, it's, uh, I've been very lucky to, especially since I've been in the States, to have been you know, in America since 2015, and I've been presented with, an incredible amount of opportunities where I've got to do some really, really cool things. And, you know, the, the journalism side of things has really sort of put me in the right place at the right time. So, yeah, I managed to get two Isle of Man TTs under my belt this year and last year, this year on a BMW S1000 RR and last year on a GSX-R 600 Suzuki. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny. After this year, my friend in Australia, I've, I've you know, got to ring him up just to tell him that I was all good and everything. He goes, he goes so he says, how does it feel to know that everything else you do for the rest of your life is going to suck? <laughs> <laughs> so, unfortunately, he was, it wasn't quite true, but he's he's pretty close to the money. He's nothing like riding a big bike at the Isle of Man, I can tell you that. And, and you're yeah, also- we got to talk a little bit about the Isle of Man because you have to be completely insane to do that race. Oh, yeah. We, we, talked, well, to, uh, we talked to Jeremy Toy about it. And he, he gave us the inside scoop of what's going on there. Well, Jeremy was my crew chief at Pikes Peak. So, um, you know, and, I, and I, I was on the phone to Jeremy every other day at the Isle of Man trying to work through changes and all that kind of stuff and trying to make the bike work. And, uh, but, yeah, the Pikes Peak is, is, a, is a very different race, uh, obviously, with it being going up the mountain. Most of the cambers are... On but the, most of the corners are on camber, so you are very you can kind of almost hit them while it's almost like a berm in motocross in, in some ways. And but whereas the Isle of Man, it's man, it's uh John McGuinness calls Pikes Peak a car park, and he's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how do you set up a bike for a course like that? It's you get long strays, and you get these tight things, and you have jumps and you know, walls and houses to avoid. Really, I, I learned a lot in. So the the stuff I learned at Pikes Peak, a lot of it transition to the Isle of Man in terms of site, in terms of setup, because when I first went to Pikes Peak, I made I had all my bikes really stiff. And over the years, we just gradually made them softer and softer and softer and turned them much more into real road bikes. And by the time I raced the Aprilia there, it basically was a street bike. Like there were 
you know, we revalved the fork and shock and things like that, but it was super soft. Like if you took it to Chuck Waller or somewhere like that, it'd be awful. But when I went to the Isle of Man, it, it was almost like halfway in between because you had to set it up for high speed. You had to make sure it was good over really, really sharp, awful bumps down something like the Salty Strait, which is the height, the fastest part of the circuit. You've got to make sure that the bike is stable and allows the thing to work through the stroke of the suspension while still maintaining like a straight line, if you know what I mean, because there's so many bumps that you can basically pack the shock down as you're going over because you're putting all that horsepower through the tire and through the chain and the shock's working as hard as it can. So you want to make sure that you use the full range of the shock. So the bike was almost like a halfway setup between a full like street, short circuit street bike style where it's super stiff and a little, and but you needed to be able to make sure the, the suspension worked through a stroke. But they're not that different to, to really like what you have at a, um, you know, a short circuit style. I mean, like the guys at the front, like Peter Hickman and that, I mean, yeah, they are a, a little bit different, but they're not that different to what they're running in, in British Superbike. It's not like Pikes Peak where it was a fair bit different to what we would normally run. But, yeah, it was that the TT throws every possible style of riding at you in terms of road racing and certainly every style of corner, the fastest straight you'll ever do, the fastest corners you'll ever do, the bumpiest corners you'll ever do, the it's, it's literally everything. The slowest corners you'll ever do. Like, I mean, that's another thing. Like, you come through, you get down to Quarter Bridge after going through down Bray Hill over Agosley, and that's you. Once you get out of the last corner, you are flat out until you hit Quarter Bridge. So you don't back off for three miles, and you're going downhill, uphill, over jumps, and the bike's got to. You, you kind of ride it like a dirt bike, really. Like you, if you ever see the guys going over some Indians crossroads, they're out of the seat. You, you, your ass is out of the seat, so the bike can just move and bounce around underneath you, and you just hang on tight and just point the thing in the right direction and hold on. Yeah. But yeah, it's a you'll never get an adrenaline rush like it in your life. It's the it's the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> All right, so you went a second time, huh? Uh, I'd go a third time if I could. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I, I I haven't ruled out going back next year, but the the one thing I noticed with being on a superbike is that level now is really high, like really, really high. The, when you're racing against Peter Hickman, Josh Brooks, you know Dean Harrison, uh, whoever else, Connor Cummins, David Johnson, Michael Dunlop, yeah, jeez. Um, you know, you you realize your level your level on the on the pecking order, and you know I was definitely down the bottom feeding sort of level. You know, they were the sharks, and I was the I was the shrimp sort of thing. So, you but the good thing about the TT is that you you are basically you are only racing the clock. You're not you're not racing them. Um, so you can gauge them, and you can it's just like picking the next guy off and pick the next guy off, and so it it does become almost a little bit safer in a way because it's just you versus it's you versus yourself for the most part. Um, you know, if you see somebody on track, that means, uh, or if you're catching the guy on track, that means you're going good, keep going. If you get caught, it means you're not going good, keep going. And so, um, but yeah, I'd love to go back. It's, it'll always hold a special place in my heart after, you know, my father raced it three times and um, I grew up with photos of TT races and all that stuff in the, in the garage and in the house and I always wanted to do it never thought I would get the chance and I made my TT debut when I was 39 um, so it's never too late to to get the dream going and geez I wish I did it 10 years ago because I <laughs> probably would have moved to the UK and become a TT racer but yeah I got two more if I never get to do it again then that's cool I got two more TTs than I never than I ever thought I would so gotta be happy with that I think yeah, and that's one of the places I think where just participating is a huge achievement, yeah. and and finishing it, yeah. and you know not being finishing two days after everybody else, is yeah. just an immense credit to the rider. Well, they they this year, well sorry, not this year, last year they limited the amount of entries that you could go. There used to be like eighty plus entries, and there was a big problem with the differences between the fast guys and the slow guys. Um, so you know, people really you should never get lapped at the TT. If you're getting lapped at the TT, there's something wrong with you because there's 37 miles between you and the 
and the next and the fastest guy if you're at the back. So you really, if you're getting lapped, you're too slow. Um, and a lot of guys were getting, so many people were getting lapped. And so they realized how dangerous it was. Uh, uh, closing speeds between those guys were enormous. Um, so this year, last year, sorry, there was 50 riders limited in the superbike class and 60 in the super sport. And you had to, same like, like every, like a Moto America race, you've got to qualify within 110%. And so as long as you're within that range, you should be pretty good to go. Um, and yeah, then it is a good feeling to see the end of the, it, see the checkered flag at the end of the, like, yeah, that adrenaline rush. When that, that's the thing. It's not, it's not a great amount of fun when you're doing it. You know, it's like you're just so focused on trying to make sure the bike stays in the straight line. But once you, once you get off and uh, you take the helmet off and you can let, let it all sink in, that's when it's, uh, that's when it's a good feeling. Unbelievable, yeah. And and I bet uh how long is the race? It's a couple of hours, right? Yeah, the big one the big ones are the superbike and the senior and they're six laps. Um they're about about an hour and a bit over an hour and a half, hour and forty minutes. Um I think first to last is about fifteen minutes difference. I, I don't know exactly. Um but the super sport and the super sports four lappers two four lap races the super stock is two three lap races so the i mean the three lap races are just sprint races you know like the sprint races with a pit stop and you know they're, they're just about an hour's long um and you're it feels like five minutes i'm not kidding like you'll 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 come in after because you you'll do you come in after your first lap fill up and then bang you're out because that way you get a flying lap um, instead of it being uh, coming out of the pits and then having to get up to speed, you do first lap, you do pit stop, and then you got flying lap in the second flight. Oh, sorry, coming out of pits in the second lap, and then your last lap is a flying lap. And that's the that's the good one. That's when you yeah you hold the thing wide open from from the last corner to, to quarter bridge, and yeah, that's a that's a hell of a feeling. How, how long did it take you to uh, study the course? Uh, I I mean, I'd known it for a long time because of my, you know, history, I guess, and my interest in the race. And I, I knew a lot of the, a lot of the spots in the track, but I really started fully. Cause like when I learned Pikes Peak, I learned it on YouTube and, uh, PlayStation. And I did the same thing with the TT. When I went over to the TT in 2019 in, uh, to do my, cause when you're a first timer, you have to go over there on your own dime to do rookie orientation laps and you basically you're in a car for a week and you, especially if you don't live in the UK where you can't just hop back and forth so I was coming to California it's a bit difficult but I went there for a week and I just got in a car and sun up to sundown and then an hour or in the darkness just around and around and around and I think I got 28 or 29 laps in in that week which is still not much and but then I'd watch the YouTube videos that night. I'd come back to California and then I'd be on the PlayStation. I always did a thing where it was watch a lap, play a lap, watch a lap. And the next day would be play a lap, watch a lap, play a lap and just alternate between those. And that was an hour every day for, I don't know, eight, nine months. And I knew exactly where I was going. But the difference is not so much, same with Pikes Peak, it's not so much where it's going. It's all the little nuances, like little camber changes and the bumps and the where, where a little gutter sticks out here and where a tree hedge is over there and just all these things. But, you know, like Glenn Irwin said it best when he was there because he was a rookie the same year I was, where he goes, look, man, if there's 37 miles and you have to learn it with a gun to your head, you'll learn it. <laughs> and, you yeah, know, he's, he's exactly right. It's amazing what the human brain can take in if it needs to survive. <laughs> and that's quite impressive because that's one thing is memorizing a 2.5 or 3 mile track and you're doing 30 40 laps on it and one is 40 yeah, mile Yeah, I mean you can't go there unless you know what you do know where you're going. That's I mean same with any street race really or any race track let's be honest but especially there, you know, the consequences are so big if you if you do screw it up, um you run right run wide anywhere and you could end up in someone's kitchen. So you, you really got to be careful and just, uh, Milky Quail, I don't know if you know Milky, but he's the, 
basically the guy who gives the green light to the rookies. Um, so you have to do you you do your laps with Milky, and he basically quizzes you in the car, like what's coming up here? Okay, what's this name? And you know, it's a bit of a informal test, but it's the it's the acid test kind of thing. And he always explained it to me. Riding the TT course is like having a, uh, a well, listening to classical music with a bottle of water in your hands. Yeah, you want to just like create all a bottle of water and have that nice flow of water, and not have the water smash into every side of the bottle, and just have the have the classical music playing in the background and just join the dots. That's all it is. It's just just join the dots, and you know, if, once you've got the point where you know the dots can be joined, then you can go. Okay, I can go a little bit faster here. I can break a little bit harder there. I, um, the big thing with the TT is, and like any road racing, but especially the old man because it is so fast and straight are so long. It's all about exit speed on the corners. Like get the get the thing set up so you can get as much drive as possible to maximize your top speed. Because you can right. that can make a difference of 10, 15 mile an hour at the end of it, which is light years. So, so between that and bike speak, if you could do one again, which one? Uh, a TT without a doubt. No mm -hmm. doubt. Like, I mean, like Pikes Peak was Pikes Peak was bloody good fun. Let me uh, let me be honest. Like, I if I had never done the Isle of Man, I would have been completely happy just to have signed off at Pikes Peak because it's pretty rare that you get a national park closed down on your on your two I and they say, right, go for it. I'm like, great, but there's just you know there's just nothing like the Isle of Man. Like everything about the thing from the racetrack itself to the way that because it is motorcycle island for two weeks like everywhere you go there's bikes it's you're not a sideshow to the cars like you are at bike speed like every cafe you go to there's a bike in the cafe there's tt posters everywhere there's just and particularly if you walk around with that competitor wrist on you and competitor band on your wrist you just get the keys to the city it's bloody amazing like you get treated like a rock star it's crazy but um I mean, just in terms of sheer adrenaline, there's just nothing like TT. It's, it's just completely on a separate level to anything else I've ever done. And, and between all that, you found you found time to write a children's book? Yeah, I've actually never finished the second. second. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the second one's actually on the Isle of Man, funnily enough, on the, on the 1992 senior TT between Steve Islop and Carl Fogarty. There were changed to it's called race of the titans and should be out the next couple of months um in the process of getting designed but yeah the first book was uh, the big book of motorbikes it was a bit more of a covid project than anything you know everyone was kind of sitting on their hands doing nothing and had a bit of time so um i always knew that like just I had my, at the time my son was three and every time i would read him a bike book he'd always get he would always be happy and I was asking, and I looked and said, "These all these bike books are rubbish. I could do better ones than this." And so, so I wrote a wrote one, you know, just knocked it out quickly. And then, but then, it's like anything, you know, you, the actual writing part is probably the quickest part, and then it's all the development. And it was a bit of an exercise in self publishing and learning how the whole thing works. And uh, but yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. Like it's it still continues to sell on Amazon. Um, you know, it's always been there. So we got a coloring in book as well that we we made to go to go with it and it's been great you know i still get messages every now and then from parents around the world that say they bought it for their kid i mean it is sold everywhere you know like i've had people from india from brazil south africa australia you know all over the us um you know mexico like everywhere and and i was like wow this really did reach a lot of people and I, mean, I guess that's i guess that's the reach of amazon more than anything <laughs> but yeah people seem to love it and Hey, if it gets kids riding, that's, I mean, that was honest, honest to God, that was the whole reason I did it. Like it wasn't, it hasn't made any money. It's paid for itself, but that's about it. But the whole point was to get people excited about riding bikes again, because I care a lot about this, you know, activity. It's become my life. It's been, that's how I make my money. And, you know, I want to make sure it continues. Yeah. We always say it's important to make sure we're not the last generation that rides motorcycles, but you actually did something about it. Oh, hopefully, hopefully it made a little difference. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Did, did any of the parents that bought the book for their kids say, I will let them ride the motorcycle? Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. We actually had a couple of people that uh, they, a couple of people got get, got gifted the book by motorcycle friends to 
um, you know, to the families who didn't ride and then all the kids were like, oh, I want a bike, I want a bike, I want a bike. And, and yeah, they've actually got out and bought them, you know, little peewees and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yes, another one infected. All right. <laughs> Yeah, actually, you're the only hero of that generation. I, I don't know anybody else who's doing anything to get kids to like motorcycles and actually parents to be convinced that this is an activity that, you know, you can kill yourself crossing the street. It's not like... Totally. Oh, I mean, like, the world's wrapped, in, right. I mean, world's wrapped in cotton wool these days. And, I mean, like, I, I look at my, my own boy and he's got a couple of little... So he's got a Stasic and... And he's riding around on one of those Kawasaki electrodes, and I mean, God, the the ability for kids to be able to ride these days with electric bikes, especially, is just so far out from what I grew up in, where like you had to put the bike in the trailer and you know you go out to the middle of nowhere and have a ride. Whereas now, like, I mean, he rides that thing almost every day. He rides to school, like that, and we've got a we've got a little sort of dirt side thing on a garden, and he sort of makes a little track and rides up and down it. And, actually likes going to school which i'm all for <laughs> like you know i mean it's but it's such a good bonding exercise between parents and and kids that i think a part of that gets overlooked um you know a lot of people get too freaked out in terms of the danger and the possibility of getting hurt and all that stuff but they don't see the good of what, what it could do for father son father daughter mother son mother daughter whatever entire family relationships it's kind of a it's a good thing that uh, keeps them all keeps them all together yeah, that's where I found dirt tracks attract more family-like activities. Like whenever I go there, there's always campers and the families are all out there together. And um, you go to the actual racetrack, road road racing, and you don't see that very much. It's usually people on their own doing their thing, and then they'll meet their family after the you know day is over. Yeah, Whereas I think it's a lot more dirt, serious does... too in road racing. So it's at least with dirt track, you know, you can rock up there with a bike, with a dirt bike in the back and just go for it. Whereas there's a lot of effort that goes into road racing. I mean, even just to do it at the the basic, basic bottom level is still an enormous exercise. And there's a lot of investment involved. Whereas, you know, go to dirt track, you throw a couple of wheels on it and off you go. Yeah, absolutely. And it's much less intimidating. The bikes are lighter. You can get a small one. You know, you fall, it's not a hard surface, typically. So that's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to freak kids out either. Like, I mean, yeah, if you want to race the next Mark Marquez, go for it. But, like, you, you've you got to – kids have got to want to do it. You know, like, there's no point in putting all this investment into something in the hope that they're going to do it. And then when they see all this pressure come on them, they're like, oh, what is this? I mean, like, a friend of mine who lives just a couple of doors down, like, he bought his boy – he bought his kid a KTM 50. Like he had a little Peewee 50. He was like, all right, cool. We're going to go race it. And so he bought his kid one of those SX 50s and he hated it. Like he was like, this sucks. Like I don't want to be around this. And then he went, then he, then he saw his mum had a TTR uh, 125. He goes, let me try that. And so he, he grabbed that and he goes, that's so much more fun. So they got rid of the KTM, bought him a TTR 125. And they just go out to Lake Elsinore and just bash into each other and laugh their heads off. And, you know, it's, he's clearly not a racer, doesn't want to be a racer, wants to go and ride bikes. And at the end of the day, that's whether you race or not or whatever it is that you do, if, as long as you're going out for a ride, that's all I care about. Yep. 100%. So we, we did this to talk bikes, actually. And as usual, I got us on a tangent <laughs> and I could see Gal cringing and saying, we're, we're going to run out of time here. No, we're not. <laughs> so we, so we, we probably got... should get back to that, right? We got time. I have a really big SD card. All right, good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I guess question number one, uh, as a uh, sequitur, how was the B riding the BMW in the TT? Uh, it was fantastic. Um, it was a bit difficult in terms of set, well, very difficult in terms of setup because I didn't get on the bike until the last day of practice. Um, yeah, I don't know if you know the story, but I was originally supposed to ride for a Honda team and we had a, a number of issues with the with the bike and I basically said I'm not riding this thing. Um, it's not worth, you know, ending up as a bloody hood ornament, hood, a hood ornament on some dude's driveway. Um, and then I managed to, by the grace of God, managed to 
get a ride on a BMW team at the last minute. So that last was all about just getting the bike qualified and all the setup changes and everything we had to do with during the races themselves. So like we did couldn't do any practice, but yeah, beside the point, it was a fantastic bike. You know, it was it wasn't very heavily breathed on at all. Like it had two hundred and eight horsepower at the wheel and uh but it had an it had an exhaust and basically it had a tune and that was it. Um it was like the most stock of super stock bikes you could get. I mean, when you consider something like Peter Hickman's bike with pumping north of 240, 250 horsepower, um, mine was plenty fast for me, at least for not having the experience with the bike. Um, but it was really good, really, really nice and comfortable and very easy to ride over a long period of time. Didn't weigh you out too much. Uh, but it was, it was really, really good fun. And that was the RR, not the M, right? Yeah, yeah. It was a 2018 uh, double R with it had flash DCU from uh, Alpha Technic and had an exhaust on it. Had kit by Tubo suspension, which is the first time I've ever ridden a Tubo stuff. Um, it was a little bit strange feeling, but but we got to head around it eventually. Um, and that was it. And some body work that made it look like Wayne Rainey's Yamaha and. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was it. Um, yeah, my there was actually the spare bike for for the teams who I joined teams main rider, and they had a new CBR one thousand that they were racing. So this bike was literally just sitting there in the corner and waiting for a rider, and I turned up at the last minute and off we went. I nicknamed it the Big Red Cadillac. It's a great bike. <laughs> so yeah, so I guess we, we maybe can start with the leader bikes, Gal. What do you think? Uh... <laughs> So, so the reason the reason we're recording this episode and and we do need a a, a different episode with you, Renny, uh, about your life. Uh, the reason why we asked you to come on the podcast is to talk about all the new models that all of a sudden just popped up. Uh, we have we have a list of at least I think twenty something bikes that um, that are brand new for twenty twenty four, and and it just it all came out of nowhere. Uh, we 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 thought the industry is winding down a little. We didn't see a lot of new models in the last four years. The stuff we saw was, I think, mainly, mainly Italian. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're watching Eichma, and we got all this huge list of motorcycles. So we figured we'll, we'll get the best journalist around to talk about those motorcycles because. You rode on some, uh, and you did the research on some, and and you're really way more qualified than anybody else to to talk about all those all those new motorcycles that have come out. So we made a list, and put me on a pedestal here, man. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll and then we'll knock you down and chuck a wall. No, yeah, I'm, just, exactly. no, I'm just kidding. Yep. I'm just kidding. Uh, and uh, we made a list, and and. Uh, we we went over it and you said okay those are those are coming into the US those are not coming into the US uh, so I, maybe we can go over that list and just talk a little bit about every every motorcycle and some of them you rode uh, and and then we can we can give people a feeling of, of what's what's out there and what's coming out there. Yep, sure, let's do it. So uh, we started with with Suzuki and. Uh, Suzuki. What a coincidence! What a what a coincidence that one of us has two Suzukis. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's Suzuki, as as far as I'm concerned, they keep you know, I, I keep hope alive <laughs> because I'm a Jixer guy. We all um, keep hope alive. We should do something about it. Yeah, but but in a traditional Yamaha calling R7 and R7, which it's not, uh, Suzuki came up with a GSX 8R. They just moved moved the R to the side. Yeah, uh, yeah. and it and quite a, quite a naming there. Yeah, and and it's it's now a parallel twin. Uh, so what do you know about that that bike? Well, I rode the the naked bike version of it in France earlier this year. Um, GSX-8, I think it is. Uh, 8S, yeah, GSX-8S. And it was actually not a bad bike. Like, it's it's not as hard-edged as something like, um, say, your Aprilia 
uh, to one a six sixty or something like that. Or uh, it's I guess it's fairly close to an MT07 Yamaha uh, in terms of spec and price and all that stuff. But it's got a good little engine on it. Uh, it's made you know like this is the great thing about Suzuki's is even though they are you know it is incredibly frustrating how yeah, the 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 rate of change at which happens at Suzuki if it ever happens. What you do get is always really, really good quality. And that's that's been a hallmark of Suzuki now for so long. Um, God, I wish they would bring out a new Chicks 1000, but there we go. Um, the, so the GSX-8R is basically that bike with uh, the 8S, but with body weight. You know, there's not much there's not much difference to it. It's It's got a bit of an odd-shaped fairing, I've got to say. It's, it's not one of those, it's not one of those, terribly aesthetically pleasing looking fairings like um you know how like when the ninja 650 and that came out it looked like almost looked like a, it was a zx6 that was missing a chromosome or something whereas the <laughs> whereas the uh and that's kind of been the the way that these twin bikes have sort of evolved you know they they're not as sporty which i guess is by design they don't look as sporty because they're not as sporty um, I'm very interested to see what the race kit's going to look like, and I'm pretty certain that that thing's going to get homologated for Moto America Twins Cup racing in some way or another, because you can bet your bottom dollar that the M4 team's going to want to run those things uh, at some point, probably not next year, but maybe the year after, when they're running that SV650, which is, what, 23 years old now, yeah. um, for a long time, which was actually a pretty good bike, but those things just cost insane levels of money which i completely disagree with anyway i digress um yeah so ADAR, not much different to the 8s uh very much just a you know throw some it's not full clip-on handlebars like raised clip-ons that sit on the top of the triple clamp um so yeah it's a sporty-ish bike um definitely going to be a good platform for for twins cup racing uh soon enough and probably also city riding right if, if someone wants to yeah yeah, I mean, it, you can almost look at it in terms of like a a, cl a higher bar clip on naked bike. Uh, so with with bodywork, we should say um, it's kind of like the best of both worlds you know, in a way. And and that's been that's been a bit of a, a flavor now for for quite some time. Especially again, I go back to the Ninja Six Fifty. Um, that's the perfect example of it. Even the um, the RS Six Sixty. That's that's also not quite as sporty as what you would originally think it would be the for the for the Aprilia. But yeah, that's a it's gonna be a good little thing actually. Like the this seems to be more the way that the sports bikes are getting their development because they realise now that you just couldn't no one's building six hundred CC four cylinders anymore. Um at least on Europe they're not selling them. I mean Honda's bought out that new six hundred double R which we're not getting fortunately. But there's a lot of development going into these things because you can make them cheap. You can get them through most of the world emission laws. That that's the biggest thing with, with motorcycles now, bar none, is getting them through emissions. Doesn't matter whether it's a bloody thousand cc superbike or a two fifty cc liner. They've all got to get through Euro five emissions, and and that's honestly a lot of the reason why so many of these bikes are just gradually creeping up in capacity because it's a smaller motorcycle engine is harder to get through emissions than a bigger one. And that's just the facts of it. Yeah, I, I, I thought they did a super sport like that. I just, I didn't think it sold very well. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a bit of an, an anomaly, the Ducati super sport. Um, I remember riding it back in, geez, six, seven years ago now. Um, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't a bad bike. It wasn't a bad bike. It was just not. I think it kind of missed the mark in terms of the what the Ducati riders like. You know, they they really had pigeonholed themselves a fair bit in the last few years. I mean, if you take out the the scrambler line and things like that, they've really become very hard edge, a bit more KTM like in their, you know, super bikes and 180 horsepower adventure bikes and you know, things like that new super mono, that that fantastic looking 696 or whatever it is super mono ducati thing i can't wait to ride that thing that's going to be awesome but again it's a hard edge sporty kind of thing and that's kind of what ducati's that's their direction so i don't think that super sport bike maybe fit the bill quite as much as what they were 
that's what they were hoping. And I, and I and I think the proof's in the pudding. Like I've never seen one on the street ever. So yeah, usually you get to see one or two of them occasionally, but I just I haven't yeah. seen one at all. Yeah, I thought they built them just to get new riders in the fold, with kind of not these ultra powerful bikes and. I guess the brand just doesn't attract these people. Well, I think so. It's like uh, I've I know a lot of the guys at Ducati quite well, and especially in, in in Italy. And I think what they realize is that Ducati is it is the Ferrari of motorcycles. Let's let's be honest. And like you don't start off learning in a Ferrari. Like you you graduate to a Ferrari, and they, I think that's what they've done. I mean, I, I, I guess maybe it's, take that with a bit of a grain of salt because you you are taking things like scramblers and that kind of stuff. And that's just completely separate. But in terms of sporty motorcycles, like there's not much point in coming out with really, really small capacity uh, or smaller, sportier versions of motorcycles when you've got a Panigale V4R that pumps out 200 horsepower and costs you 50,000 bucks or whatever it is that they cost. So, yeah, I think they kind of realise that their market is the affluent market that have been riding for a while They've and they know, okay, I want a Ducati because I've seen Alvaro Batista, you know, wax everybody on it's the fastest superbike in the world. That's what I want. And that's kind of what they're, I think they're leaning towards these days. I, I realized that they're more like Ferrari when I saw those pictures of the internet of the Panigale burnt to a crisp. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> that's exactly what Ferraris do on hot days. Yeah, <laughs> you have good insurance, man. <laughs> and, and then going back to Suzuki, um, they're they're just toying me with me now because they're putting the Gixxer engine into a, what is it called a crossover? Yeah, so this GSX S one thousand GT GX Plus, which is just the worst body name. Um, <laughs> like I don't, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand why they have to make it so difficult. Um, the that's going to be a really good bike. I'm I'm really pumped to see that. Uh, I mean, the Gixxer 1000 engine, regardless of the fact that it's 900 years old, is still a very good engine. Um, you know, 2017, I think, was the last iteration that we had come out, but it's you know, strong as houses. It's a it's a solid solid engine and really well suited to something like the the uh, almost like a BMW S1000 XR kind of style. Um, I guess you could you could argue the same thing with the Multistrada V4S. Um, similar to that regard maybe not quite because the silver right doesn't run 17 inch wheels but that's going to be quite a good bike it's quite expensive for a suzuki as well i think it's about 19 grand which when you, you have a look through the range you know that's definitely right up there for for suzuki but it also uh comes out with suzuki's first go at electronic suspension which that's a big thing for suzuki um they've been incredibly reluctant to jump on that bandwagon for a really, really long time and have relied on their suppliers and I think it's KYB really that they get most of their stuff out of. But for them to jump on the electronic bandwagon, it's, it's about time because everyone else did it a long time ago. Um, but I, I have a feeling that one's going to be a really, really good bike this year. Is it, is it really that much of a difference that, that skyhook suspension versus just get the suspension right to begin with? Look, not really, honestly. Um, but the 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 advantage with that stuff is that you can change it, and they if you as long as you stay within the preset parameters, especially when you get on like a Ducati Skyhawk suspension or something like that, that stuff's really good. You know, like especially for street stuff. I mean, I actually raced an R one uh, earlier this year that still had the 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 base electronic suspension out. That was pretty good. Like I raced a Chuck Waller and things like. Like forty sevens or something on it, a Chuck Waller. Well, it was still in electronic mode, and it was. I mean, it definitely felt weird, but it's not bad. Whereas, and that's but that's using it at the extreme end of the of the scale. Whereas roads, you know, that we all ride on are filled with potholes. They've got speed bumps. They've got cracky braking surfaces. They've got beautifully smooth tarmac. They've got you know rocks that fall down off the side of the road or whatever it may be. So. Electronic suspension works much better in that regard, in that it's adaptable to the to the conditions. If you get your perfectly tuned, absolutely dialed suspension, then uh, analog suspension, then look, it's it's going to be good for ninety percent of the time. But you're not going to be able to change it on the fly. 
I mean, I've done, I've the the last couple of years I've actually started to use electronic suspension for what it is much more, especially with especially with off road stuff um, with big maxi adventure bikes like the Multi Strider Rally, the Super Adventure twelve ninety, all that stuff. Like it really does make a big difference. So you know, I think it's horses for horses really. If you're an analog guy, you'll probably never get convinced, but most of the time, I mean, you kind of got to get on board because all the big bikes are all going this way now and it just allows people to have a bit more choice in how their bike rides, which I think is probably a good thing. I was talking to Zemke, who rides a V4S at the track, yeah. and surprisingly, he gave the same opinion as you. He said, it's fine. Yeah. You know, I don't want to go back to analog. I, I could race this bike the way it is off the fact, pretty much off the factory floor. Um, and uh, he had really good things to say about the electronic suspension and the way it works. You know, a lot of purists go like, no, no, you got to have your suspension. No, what it's going to do. Most people can't even give the right feedback to tune yeah. their suspension. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah, exactly right. right for them. I mean, Zemke, Zemke's so bloody fast, he could ride a fridge quickly. But the, you know, the, the way the electronic suspension is now, I mean, I remember, this is telling me how long I've been doing this job, like I remember back when... BMW released the HP4 race back in 2012, which was the first real kind of semi-active suspension on a sports bike that I can remember. Was it? Yeah, I think it was. Um, everyone still at the time was still using analog suspension, and it was awful. Like, it didn't know where it was half the time. I mean, not, I shouldn't say awful. It was not anywhere near as good as well set up on analog suspension. And... I still think, honestly, like a good set of analog forks when you're racing a motorcycle is still the way to go. Um, and I, even though Zemke could, could ride that thing in a race tomorrow, no problem. I'm sure like if they was given a really nice set of factory race forks versus electronic forks, he's still going to go with the, the, the factory race forks. But that's not to say that what, the, what is out now is not really bloody good. You know, it's it's taken huge leaps and especially since IMUs came in, um, which was what sort of six, seven years ago now when we started seeing the first time use. I mean, uh, well, no, more than that. It was the, it's funny. Aprilia actually 2011? technically had the first IMU in 2012 or 13, I think it was, but never said anything about it. And Yamaha was the first one that actually walked out and said, we have a quote unquote IMU in the 2015 R1. So when all that stuff started happening and the more development came on and the suspension companies got behind how this system actually works, I mean, the suspension quality just went through the roof. So you can, yeah, you can jump on a V4S, no problem. You go race it in your club race tomorrow and you'll be totally fine. Yeah, before that, I remember they had the bizarre systems that were just wheel, yeah. wheel speed sensors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, all that stuff, it's all precursor now to what the IMU is capable of. I mean, that without that, that little thing is, I mean, I would argue that the IMU is the biggest technological breakthrough that motorcycles have had for decades. You know, it's just allowed, especially in terms of ABS, cornering ABS, that kind of, and cornering traction control, like those three things have become mainstays now in high quality motorcycles. And they've probably saved a bunch of lives that we're never going to hear of. Yeah. I'm a little skeptical and you know I'm not at that level of, of speed anyway, but like the cornering ABS, I mean, straight line ABS scared the heck out of me the first time I really felt it. And I thought the bike was going to stop and it didn't. Uh, and I was actually in Australia at uh, Phillip Island on, a, on an S1000 RR. Oh, yeah. Like at the end of, end of that front straight and I'm hitting the brakes a little harder than I should. And all of a sudden it kind of released a little bit. And it, it is a uh, scary moment. So I can I only imagine should, in the middle uh, of a corner. Yeah, I should reiterate that ABS is still much, you're much better to have ABS on the road than on the racetrack. Um, yeah. yeah, like I would never race with ABS, like at that, like because the the braking forces required, especially if you're running slick tires, like braking forces required are much bigger than what an ABS system is prepared to give you. Um, yeah, I did a I did a test with Bosch a number of years ago, like you know, eight nine years ago now, when IMUs came out uh, on the Multistrada. The first time we came out Multistrada, we went out to Bosch out in Michigan, and we did all these different tests. Uh, and and the best part is it rained like 
absolutely pissed down, which normally would be the worst thing, but for an ABS test was the best. You can actually find the video. It's on Cycle News somewhere back in the analogs of our YouTube channel. But I, they were telling me, get on the throttle as hard as you want, get on the brakes as hard as you want while you're cranked over. And I'm like, okay. And I'm just like, okay, here comes a broken collarbone. And I remember going in pissing down rain. Like I remember come around the corner, full on the throttle as hard as I could, cranked it in and then just full hand full of front brake. And I'm just waiting for the thing to control. And it, so it didn't stand itself upright. It just rrr, it continued on its line and it just stopped. And I was like, oh, holy crap, it actually does work. And that was on a multi strike. So I think with sports braking and that, sports bikes, you've got to be, you know, default back to a more rider skill. But as far as big tourers go, um, big adventure bikes, um, sports naked bikes, all that kind of stuff, yeah, that stuff like cornering ABS is an absolute game changer. I actually think I've read that article because weren't you the one who said you couldn't crash this bike even if you wanted to? Uh, probably, which was a fairly silly thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, but it gives you an idea of how effective the system is. I mean, is. you really you had to try hard to to crash the thing. And and that was, you know, God honest truth. Like, I was doing stuff like I was fully prepared to snap my collarbones. Like, I fully thought I was going to go down I mean, I was younger at the time, so I was just like, ah, screw it. And it, the system worked. And um, the big difference, though, now with ABS, we're kind of going fairly off tangent here, but the like, big difference with ABS now, especially, is how good it is off road. That's where the, with, mm. you know, I guess that comes from wet weather development, off road development, things like that. But nowadays, like, time was where you would switch all ABS off on off road, unless you're trying to, buddy, Ken Roxon, like, don't really need to. If you're if you're just cruising along on fire trails and you're going for a ride in the mountains in Colorado, like, yeah, leave it on. Like, especially leave it on the front. Maybe take it off on the rear, but for sure leave it on the front. There's no need not to. I mean, it's, it's that good now. It actually saved me once. I was making a left turn on intersection. Car b blows the red light coming the other way, and there was a little dust on the intersection. So I hit the brake a little harder than I should, and I felt the front sliding, and then it caught it. And all of a sudden, I'm still upright. And like, if if there was no ABS, I would have eaten the yeah the dirt. No question about it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first time I ever tried ABS as a bike chain was in 2008 on a CB 1000 or CB 1100 Honda back in Australia, and they were saying, "Yeah, just give it a try." And I went, "Okay." So I went down this hill at about 120k an hour, which is at about 65 mile an hour or so. I just went, "Crap." And I just leaved on the front end. And this, the pads just went clang, 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 clang. Oh, bike just shook its head off, and yeah, it was just like it was terrifying. And but very, very pre IMU ABS systems, which hadn't had a lot of development by that stage. And I was like, oh, God, I'm never having ABS again. But uh, I couldn't couldn't have changed my tune more by now. <laughs> I don't ride much on the road, but um, I did have a 2016 RSV4 for a while, and I took it to Fontana, and and that ABS just made me miss corner after corner after corner. I was so pissed, and yeah. uh, I, I never actually rode that bike on the road, uh, but I do have a new bike coming that, that is for road use, uh, So and it does have an ABS, so we'll see how that, that does. Man, look. ABS is there to stop you from screwing up. So a lot of the time, you know, you want to use electronics as least as possible. It doesn't matter whether it's traction control, wheelie control, ABS, whatever it is. Like if you are at the point where you are needing ABS in anything other than an emergency situation, you should probably go get some rider training. <laughs> I did. It didn't help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the next yeah, man. I'm still not sold on the racetrack stuff either. But nah, sort of the, the new. I'm talking track. about the 2012 Diavel and the 2013 or 14 Panigale, but uh, the new ones I'm sure are done better. Yeah, the massive difference compared to what they were. I mean, even your RSV4, it would be much better since then. Um, huge difference. I, I think I think it's it's good that Ducatis have uh, ABS, especially your Ducatis in the bill. 
uh, because of the oil leaks. So, <laughs> so oil, oil leaks go backwards, not uh, forward. Well, though. they got That's ABS on the rear too. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I've been pretty lucky. Um, Javel never a problem. The Panigali had some uh, head gasket leak, fixed under warranty. That was like eight years ago. Never had a problem since. I, I heard the so, new Gucci's leak too. Those V one hundreds. So yeah, I spent too much time in Italy over there. It's an Italian feature. Yeah, it's an Italian feature. Next manufacturer. And British. <laughs> British. Uh, the next manufacturer is Honda. Uh, Honda has a slew of new motorcycles, and and you said we're getting almost none of them. Pretty um, much, yeah. Um, yeah. So first of all, why? Second of all, if we can just uh, do a little overview of of each model there and what segment of the population it's it's meant for. The um, well, I mean, if you look at the list, you have NX500, CV500 Hornet, CVR500R, CVR600RR, CVR650R, CV1000 Hornet, new five blade and Acre Twin. Um, American Honda has not released any data as to what they're bringing in. Um, they have only done things like returning models for, for this year, whatever those are, you know. Um, if you have a look at like what all the ma major publications have covered as well, most of them are only focused on the uh, if if they were to look at stuff that wasn't coming into America just yet on the new CBR thousand double R RSP and the new CBR six hundred double R. I would be very very surprised if the six hundred double R ever gets to America. Um, the and it's look, it's not, it's not a ground up rejob or anything like that. You know, it's just no, I think for them to be able to keep selling it in Europe. Whereas the, the Fireblade, that will come in, no doubt. Um, it might still come in, um, but from what I was told, from having a chat with um, uh, the guys at American Honda, they weren't planning to bring it in next year. So, it'll, if it does come in, it'll, it'll probably be twenty twenty five. Do we know the numbers of how many Fireblades they sold so far? Uh, I don't know. I no. can tell you. Okay. I think yeah, I the, the, the Fireblades are Fireblade is a beautiful motorcycle. Like it is so well put together. I mean, it's it is typical Honda build quality. Like it's a gorgeous, gorgeous bike, and they're really, really well made. But they also have a lot of those foibles where, like, if you ever looked at club racing, where you got to unlock all these various things to make them go quick and I mean, if you look at Jeff May earlier this year um, and last year, he was the only one with a CBR 1000 in any big bike class on a national level that was doing anything. Um, so it showed it kind of, it's a bit of a shame that Honda kind of paints themselves into a corner like that. Um, they, it's their own fault, honestly. And it's a thing that HRC have been doing now for decades where you, I mean, if you're lucky enough back in the day to buy an RC45, things came to America with 100 horsepower. And, you know, the, the, the World Superbike were pumping out 160, so you had to buy the HRC kit to make them work. And and that's the same as what it is with with the current CBR 1000s. That's why you never see any of them in, in club racing. Yeah, and, and uh, look look at who won, uh, look at who won uh, uh, Superstock in Motor America. The GSX-R1000, right? There you go. There you go. He's in the still. Oh, Hayden Gillum, man. He's fighting a good fight. <laughs> uh, so, well, so, and they're not doing much in World Superbike with a fire blade. So, no, that doesn't get anybody excited. It, it, no. it was, it was a nice cushy couch for Batista for a year. Uh, well, while he was still working yeah. his, his whatever he had with Ducati, uh, the bench. So it was, yeah, it was his bench. <laughs> that bike yeah pretty much i bet you caddy's uh, a bit pissed that they they told him they told him they already didn't have a seat they probably would have won four championships by now yeah yeah, yeah. so here's our plea to uh honda bring the fire blade yeah yeah i like to say the fire i'd love to say the cbr 600 honestly um i think 
and they still have something to offer. But look, they are very old. Let's be honest. You know, they're they're not they're not uh, the spring chickens that they used to be. Even if it is all dressed up and new, uh, a bit like the Kawasaki ZX6. You know, I mean, I tested that. That's new for this year, and I tested that uh, a couple of months ago. And yeah, it's got new bodywork, which looks great. Like the bike's really good looking now. Um, and I've been told by a certain team owner in Moto America that the, it's lucky that someone that the people have figured out how to make the ZX six work because it's the best super sport bike according to this one particular team owner who I won't, who I won't name. And he's uh, so it's it's good to see Kawasaki have got this thing again, but. If people, sorry to jump ahead to Kawasaki, but if people think they're getting more with their ZX6, they are unfortunately mistaken because you're actually getting less um, you know, with your 636 because you've got, um, they call it different lift and different duration camshafts, which is code for less lift, less duration camshafts, which means less air going into the combustion chamber, which means less fuel being burned, which means less horsepower. And that's the, no, it's retuned. It's got a little bit more, you know, a little bit more mid range or whatever. But yeah, overall, you you get less for your ZX6 than you did last year, which is a bit of a bummer. But on the flip side, it allows them to keep selling the bike in North America. So you've got to take the good with the bad. Hey, if you need more power, take it to Chuck. Exactly. Take it to Chuck. <laughs> He'll fix it right up for you. Yeah. So help us make sense a little bit of this. I'm throwing another tangent here. Like manufacturers seem to have very different views of the market. You know, some like Yamaha canceled the 600 completely. You know, others kept them around. Some doubled down. You know, Aprilia comes up with the 600 like out of the blue. And, uh, you know, Ducati is doubling down on like, you know, th their mid-range is in 900 or 950. You can have the smallest CC you can get. It doesn't seem like anybody agrees what direction the market's taking in terms of you know kind of bike deplacement. Uh, I think all the manufacturers got into a room together and took a bunch of mushrooms and then went their own ways. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the fact yes, that, that, that would all... explain it actually. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? One of, one of the sales tactics is your product shouldn't be. You, nobody should be able to compare your product to another product, right? Well, it's funny this because I, when we were at that ZX6 launch, I asked because I really, I was just praying that they were going to bring out a new ZX7, ZX7R or ZX7RR, um, especially considering now the way the Super Sport rules are going. And one of the guys actually, Trough Long, who's the, one of the product guys at Kawasaki, made a good point about it. I mean, it didn't, didn't allay my disappointment that it wasn't 750, but he said, look, when you look at something like the motocross scene, for example, everything, if you painted all those bikes black, 450 or 250 motocross bike, most people couldn't tell what they are. And he's dead right. Like I show, I show his help. Like maybe Ryan Nitsen, who's our dirt editor at, Motors, at, uh, at Cycle News, could, but I show sure shit couldn't. Whereas now the super sport market is kind of the most exciting market out there. Um, it's certainly the biggest pain in the ass as far as um, what do you call it? Uh, balancing rules go for people like Moto America and CVMA and all these people. I mean, CVMA just defaults to Moto America anyway. But the you know nowadays you have what nine? They're all supposed super sport bikes. You have six three six Kawasaki, seven fifty Suzuki. You've got eight hundred MV. You've got a seven six whatever it is, seven six five Triumph. You have nine fifty buddy uh Ducati, you've got a 947 cc ktm duke which will mark my words may be the platform for the new super sport bike um i mean you could technically take that duke now and throw some fairings on it and you know do it like what triumph does i mean triumph doesn't make a daytona anymore but there's street triples being raced in the british super bike super sport championship i mean hey it won the daytona 200 a couple of years ago so you could technically take that. I don't see why you couldn't take it unless Moto America says you can't homologate the bike, which is, that's a whole other argument. But the way it is now, it is pretty confusing, no doubt. Um, it's not like it was back in the day where you had 600 fours and 750 twins for Super Sport. But you got to change with the times, you know, like it's, I think it's actually kind of good that 
there are such different motorcycles within the same so-called space. Um, I mean, it's a lot like, you know, sports cars now. Like there's very two, very few two sports cars that are the same in terms of their engine capacity or their electronics package or whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of good that they're doing it. At least it gives the customer a lot more choice than I can either have a 604 from four manufacturers or I can have a 750 twin from two manufacturers. That's all I get. Whereas now I can go, oh, I can go from 600 to basically a 1,000 um, and it still be so-called a middleweight bike. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, the middleweight doesn't make sense anymore. No, it's, anything it's a pretty from redundant. 400 to 1,000. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty redundant term now, middle. I don't know what they're going to call it. Sorry, uh, guys. It, it is it is interesting to watch, but sometimes I'll sit at home and, I, and I'll watch a race, and I'm going to go, damn, those Ducatis, they always cheat. <laughs> right? the, what are they doing with a leader bike against an R6? Yeah, I mean, that's the problem. And, and honestly, that was how it was back in the early days of Superbike. You know, the, when the 916 came out, a year later, it was 955. And then, you know, it gradually grew and grew until it got to 996. And they just kept making it faster while everyone else had to stay at 754s. Um, you know, it's yeah. not like they were all of a sudden racing 821cc ZX7s. So it, it is unfortunate, but that's up to the, to the powers that be that, to be able to regulate them in the right way. And... You know, I'm, I know the, the guys at Motor America pretty well and I know the job that they have and it's it's not an easy one because the lines of getting those things spot on is so small. You can, I mean, the Ducati is the fastest bike, let's be honest. Like, you can pump out 150 horsepower. It's it's the biggest capacity bike. It should be the fastest bike. So trying to make that level where it can still race against an R6, it's pretty tough. Um, but... They seem to be doing a pretty good job of it, but you're always going to piss somebody off. Like, unless you're racing spec racing, you know, with same tires, same engine, same chassis, you know, someone's always going to go home annoyed. Yeah, and and they also have you know popularity to to think about. So if if does if Ducati is not on the grid, what is it going to do to Ducati fans? Are they going to want to watch those races? Well, I mean, the uh, Moto America is just bag is as I say, it's just bagging. Yeah. Every Moto America is just uh, putting everything on baggers. So, yeah. you know, that's, yeah. that's that's uh, that's their golden goose at the moment. Yeah, they're, they're oh, it's a fun category. I, I would, yeah, if I if I was in their shoes, I would do the same thing. Whatever it takes to to keep that business going and and thrive and get the most amount of audience. Uh, but, well, I mean, also too, so you've got two manufacturers that have. I mean, really, if you actually like look at the brass tax of it all, like the bagger championship is actually the only factory Ducati championship, uh, factory championship mm. in America, because Indian and the attack performance team is not a factory team. The Ducati team is not a factory team. They're factory supported. Um, the new Ray Hall team, that's not a factory team. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the M4 team, that's not a factory team. Like, it's a bit like British Superbike. There's no factory team to British Superbike either. They're all factory supported, but they're not at quite unquote factory teams. Whereas uh, the Baggers Championship, Harley Davidson is a factory team, Indian is a factory team, and then you've got you know trickles down from there. You know why? Um, because those are American companies. If if American companies are going to start making sport bikes, then we're going to see those in Moto America as factory teams. Yeah, I don't think you'll ever see a, a factory sport bike Indian. Or a Harley Davidson. I didn't say Indian. <laughs> I, I said <laughs> Oh or the other one. I yeah, said, the, no, I said someone someone's gonna open a factory over here and then they're gonna start making oh, sport bikes. They already got one, they've got ABR. Mm, yeah, they yeah. restarted. Yeah. 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 They're, they're still alive, I, I should say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're still <laughs> back, back from the dead yeah. for the nine hundredth time. I, I, is it still selling the old inventory from uh two thousand six? <laughs> yeah, I think so. But they do have a couple of Nice bikes. Like there's the new um, the cruiser that was developed with Roland Sands, 180 horsepower cruiser, like the Cali looking cruiser thingy. Good looking bike, actually. Like I went to the launch of that earlier in the year. I was like, that's a nice looking thing. Um, and yeah, they've got the new, I don't know if it's the hammerhead or whatever it's called, but the, it's the re reimagined version, shall we say, of the old EBR super bike that Corey West and all those guys used to ride. 
Yeah. I mean, the cruiser is a big market. That's the market in the U.S. in, in large number. That's why I like the, ca- the bagger category. I mean, can you imagine just the aftermarket parts? Yeah, the, the guy who sets the suspension or the chassis stabilizers or shorter bags or anything like that. It's yeah, it's a I mean, it's, I mean market. it's huge. I mean, like I rode, I rode uh, Tyler O'Hara's Tyler O'Hara's bike and Jeremy Williams' bike at the beginning of the year, and oh, man, like I, I mean, I was teammates with those guys last year in Roland's team in the Hooligan Championship. I had no idea how much of an animal those things are to ride, like. The, the the speed at which those guys ride those things, like normal people don't appreciate just how wild that is. Like when you're doing four seconds, five seconds a lap slower than Jake Gagne at Laguna Seca on a freaking bagger, that's nuts. That is nuts. So, um, yeah, I, I my respect for those guys went through the roof after riding those bikes. I was like, holy shit, man, these guys are freaking hauling on these things. And you can see them when they're unsettling coming out of the turns. I'm like, I can't believe half the time how they stay on these bikes. Well, there's, there's just, the, you think the amount of inertia that comes with a 600 pound motorcycle, all sitting on those tires. Like you see Bobby Fong ride that thing. I mean, it looks like the rear wheel's trying to overtake the front wheel at any given opportunity. And he keeps the thing upright. And, but I mean, poor old Bobby, he probably should have won about three or four races this year if the thing held together. But, they are hand grenades too, you know, like you, you are, there's no one, no one gets to the season unscathed without serious mechanicals. And you very rarely see that in, in top flight superbike racing and things like that, because they're just doing stuff they're not designed to do. Like it's, it's just the, the end, the end result of it. But hey, it makes for those, those three lap bloody dash for cash things, man, that's the best race of the weekend. Hey, Jeremy, Jeremy McWilliams, time. Jeremy McWilliams is a fast old man, isn't he? Oh, he's an animal. <laughs> he is an absolute beast of a guy. Like, I mean, that took, you know, I say Fuzemki could ride a fridge better quickly, so could he. And, and he's tough as nails, that dude. Like, I don't know if you saw the photo of his back after his crash at, the, at, at uh, um, Coda this year, where he got high side on the last lap. Yeah. Like, that makes me wince, that photo. Like, his entire back is just, it looks like he's just been hit by a board that's as big as he is. Oh. And then he got back on and kept riding. Yeah. Jesus. How, how old is he? 50 something? 59 or 58 or something. Yeah. I mean, he's the only one that's holding Tyler O'Hara to account. And he's on the same bike. So, I mean, I remember back when Jeremy was racing uh, 500 GPs back in 1993. Wayne Rainey was still racing back then. Yeah. I remember that. Not not that I'm old or anything because I'm, I'm only 22. Age is yeah. just a number. Age, exactly. Yeah. Age is just a number? Well, who, who said that? They're lying. I just did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we feel it every day. But So do you think we'll ever see the baggers in club racing? That would be fun. I saw them, oh, I saw them already. Hey. Yeah, they got them a chip Yeah, yeah, I saw them already. Oh, they're doing... Well, I've seen them on the track, but as a category... Yeah, well, it's a, what is it, American V Twin that they're racing? In? Yeah, they're test- yeah. They're mainly testing it for for Motor America, but I, I saw uh, I saw Mawira, I think, um, and, in Vegas, and it was they were going up against. I don't know how that even happened against an SV six fifty, um, and every corner the the SV would break harder, pass them at the entrance, and every exit they would just par right out, and if oh, I'll. Yeah. And, you know, riding that SV650 was probably super frustrating because you did all that work and all of a sudden it just power out and disappear. Uh, but, wow. you know, that, that's, uh, that's racing. Life is unfair. Yeah. Kawasaki. Kawasaki's got a, an entire range. Uh, we we're... missed Yamaha out of that. Oh, oh, didn't we miss Yamaha? Oh, I'm sorry. The MT-09 SP, which is yeah. the, one of the most interesting looking... Um, it's it's not a it's not a phrase you want to say on you know on girl but you know on a motorcycle it's interesting looking, um, <laughs> the MT09 SP. Yeah, so that's I mean look that's pretty. I guess you could you could say it's new, but like it's a styling exercise. Um, but yeah, it looks it's a good looking thing. Um, I, I think 
I mean, if you've ever ridden one of those, if you've ever ridden one of those bikes, you'll know the, how good they are. I mean, they're one of the best value bikes on the market and have been since they came out. Um, yeah, excellent bikes. So it's good to see they're still just give it a little tweak here and there. Um, it's it looks a fair bit better than what the old one old one used to. I think. Um, I think there's a few uh, a few that they've got Brembo style and calipers on it. Um, I mean, the suspension, I think, is basically the same. You've got a few new electronics here and there. Uh, I mean, the the whole, like, connectivity of phones and all that shit to motorcycles just drives me mad. Like, I don't know why I'd ever want to have my phone connected. All I want to do is, if I'm, if I'm going to have any connectivity, it's to put music in my helmet via a Bluetooth and that's it. Yeah, leave me alone. Uh, I'm riding. <laughs> exactly. Leave me alone. That's why I go. That's why I have a motorbike in the first place. But the... Yeah, it, it, it's a good looking bike. It's sort of modernized the look a little bit more. It's a real shame that we're not getting that uh, M, the MT, the, what is it? It's the, the XSR 900 GP. That's oh, cool. the sports one. Are we not getting yeah. it? Why not? This, no, this, this is one of the best that. looking bikes I've seen this year. Yeah. And it's, it's criminal that we're not getting it because that color scheme came because of Kenny Roberts and Wayne Rainey. Right. Yeah. Like, Marlboro Yamahas, and well, you could argue that it started before with uh, Jack Agostini and Eddie Lawson, but really it was, it was, you know, idolised. Roberts was the very first guy to ever run in a Marlboro paint scheme in '83 with with Eddie, and then, but everyone remembers the the Marlboro Yamahas of Wayne Rainey and John Kaczynski and Luca Catalora and all that kind of stuff. That was the glory years. So the fact it's not coming here is is a real shame. Yeah, it made no sense to me. I don't understand the decision. We're a good market for it. It it has great sentimental value to Americans. It's, it's a great bike. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a you can, you can name the laundry list of reasons why it should come, but unfortunately not. Yeah, you think that'll change? No, maybe if there's enough, if there's enough demand, maybe it might. But I like I doubt it. Um, yeah, I mean. This goes into this argument we were talking about off air about how many bikes don't arrive to America, and this is not a new problem. You know, this has been this way for decades. So it's. Right. Uh, um, I think you said. Shame. I think you said the word demand, and there, there's something called demand generation, and motorcycle companies, especially right. in the U.S., should start in looking into demand generation. If you can't sell enough units of your product, how do you create more demand for that product? Yeah. Well, it's funny because Ducati has never subscribed to this theory. Like, and if you look at their their lineup, we get everything that Ducati makes, aside from maybe one or two. But I can't even think of what they are. But for for the most part, we get every one of the Ducati. So Ducati, especially too, when you're talking about the you know, road bikes, Ducati is a street bike company. I mean, they yeah they are producing their motocross bike in a couple of years and whatever. But they are a street bike company, so they have more motorcycles on the street than most of the other manufacturers. Especially, like I think, I think they've got more than Yamaha. They've definitely got more than KTM. Uh, you know, you can kind of go on, go from there. But we get most of them, so they think it's good enough. Like I don't understand why, why the rest of them don't turn up. You know, it's the only the only people who lose out is the consumer. Yeah. There's enough people with enough money in this country where they're like, yeah, cool, I want it. Even if it was a thousand, couple of thousand bucks extra for a paint job, it looks so damn cool. But you're like, yeah, of course, yeah, whatever, I'll pay for it. I mean, it's all good. So, yeah, but unfortunately, it's been a problem that we've, we've experienced for many, many years in this country. Yeah, especially when a bike is a cross platform where, like, you know, a lot of the technical or, or parts and technician training and so on can be leveraged. As opposed to something that's completely new and exotic, and now you got to train the dealers and have specific parts and all these things. I mean, it solves a lot of problems, and yeah, they went the other way. Yeah. So we got two requests, right? The fire blade with a uh, race kit, yeah. proper race kit, and then the excess. The excess, uh, yeah. That would be at the top of my list so far for sure. And the last one from Yamaha that's new that we're also not getting is that. Tannery 700 Explorer. Yeah, I mean, Tannery 700 Explorer, yeah. So that, you know, like the travel version of their, 
uh, of the of their bike, which if you've never ridden a Tenerang 700 and you like adventure bikes, I would highly suggest you do so because it is a fantastic bike. So nothing, not 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 its massive change, little bodywork styling things here and there, but yeah, it's not a it's not a huge thing. It's not something that you couldn't build yourself pretty easily for that way. And that that bike, it's it's older than people think. They've been teasing that thing forever, and then they finally started selling it. And it, it's one of those things that I I thought was a classic marketing mistake of creating that buzz, that demand generation, and and then not capitalizing on it on time. And it's all in the timing. So when when you're showing a motorcycle, get me all excited. That looks like a Perry Dakar motorcycle. Oh, it's going to be available in three years yeah uh, so yeah. what what why are you showing it to me now so. man it's it, it is I, don't, I couldn't tell you why they do it i really don't know um whether it's the thing of having to get through emission laws and design rules and all the stuff required to sell a motorcycle in america i honestly i don't know but i do remember being intensely frustrated and i wasn't even buying them, i was just testing them but like that at the time when that bike came out, that was when this, or when it was announced, I should say, that was when this mid-sized adventure segment really started to get a bit of steam. You know, everyone before that was like big GS, big KTMs, you know, big Super Tenere Yamahas, you know, these tanks off road. And then it was when, you know, uh, like KTM came out with the 790 Adventure when uh, the smaller uh, Tiger 800s and things like that. Like when these bikes came, people realized they didn't need these gigantic bikes. And this Yamaha had the perfect engine for it. They had the bike made. You know, when we saw the bike, this is the thing, we saw the bike in 2015. That means the thing was in development for three years prior to that. So it really took them from the time they really started developing it, which was about 2012, 2013, it took them bloody five years for it to reach America. It took two years to reach everywhere else. So yeah, I don't know. Couldn't tell you why. It's bloody frustrating, but it is the way it is. At least it's a great bike, right? It is. It's awesome. It's a fantastic bike. I mean, if you had to go out and buy, if you had whatever it is, 10 grand, and you had to buy an adventure bike, that is the one you buy. Like, it's basic. It doesn't have, you know, tr proper traction control. It doesn't have proper, you know, electronics in it or anything. It does not need it. It is a really good base bike. Suspension's a bit plush and a bit, you know, a bit wallowy and things like that, but you can fix all that stuff. It's got all the right reinforcement points on it. You can crash the thing and know it's not going to explode into flames. The great thing about the lack of electronics is that, you know, you can go to the middle of absolutely bloody nowhere in theory that you're probably going to be able to make it back. You know, it's not a, there's nothing terribly advanced about it. It's a really, really good engine. It's got just the right amount of power. The throttle response is good. It sounds awesome with an exhaust on it looks bitching like dude, they, they're such good bikes those things and it's a great category i mean i, I never understood why you'd want to dig up a 1200 cc multi-strata from the dust in, in or, or a hill in in the desert that's going to weigh a ton mm. it's too heavy it's it's harder to maneuver when you actually should go lighter weight that, that's not yeah, it well, you got just as far yeah but that's not it in the bill you you just you buy that 1200 multistrada and then you put some dust on it and you cruise o starbucks. cruise over to starbucks with a lot of stickers and uh you know pretend you've been all over the world on that thing well i mean on that note so that's where the things are better i mean there's no doubt that like a 1200 multistrada is way better as far as touring long miles and that goes and then a little bit of dirt roads and things like that like yeah take them all the shot it's much more comfortable better wind protection better everything uh but yeah if you are gonna go and do actual adventure riding where you go down baja where you you know rip across bloody deserts in africa or whatever it is that you want to do then yeah get something that's that you're not going to have to screw with too much and and as you say less weight <laughs> less weight in adventure bike is always preferable Absolutely, yeah. Unless you're Petrucci. <laughs> then you can do well, whatever with, yeah. with a fridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that guy's a whole different level. Should have stayed another year. Yeah. You know, you probably, you'll probably go back at the end of it, I would say, and then 
I reckon he'll get him back into it, but he might have missed the boat. Who knows? Look, we're, we're two for two, right? We we had two Ducati guys come over, try it one year. One of them, I don't, I don't think, was even on the podium. Uh, and then, you know, and then they get offers from World Superbike and they go back. St- stay yeah, around. Yeah, well, stick another. Yeah, stick, yeah. yeah, stick around another year. See what you can do. But I think there's probably a financial reward in there at some point. Um, I mean, that was a uh, that was Ducati's problem in that they were getting these one one year riders, um, which I think they wanted to have the prestige of having an international rider, but having someone like Josh Heron on the bike who knows the place back to front. That's the right way to do it. Um, and, you know, Chavi Fares, I mean, man, if that boy gets a superbike next year, which he bloody should, if he gets a superbike next year, he is going to be right there. Um, you know, you saw how how quickly he adapted this year. And Chavi wants to make this a full-time... I don't think... I don't know if he actually wants to move full-time to the States. Like, he's... I think he did the last six months out here or so. And he's, he's got a... Little, little girl now and so he's back and forth to Spain a fair bit but um, you know I, I, actually, I do a lot of work with Ducati in in Moto America and spoken to Chavi at length and a number of times and he was like yeah I've done my time in World Superbike I've done my British Superbike I've done MotoGP just want to go and have a bit of fun and coincidentally he told me point blank he goes I want to finish my racing career on a bagger <laughs> I was like that's pretty damn cool so I wouldn't mind betting that he goes and wins the. If he gets a if he gets a superbike, I'm going to throw a hundred bucks down somewhere that he wins the championship on it, and then kisses off and goes and gets a paycheck to go right back. Is <laughs> <laughs> nice. That'd be fun to see. All right, Kawasaki. Kawasaki are always crazy. Um, so start with a Z125. Is that it? Like a Grom? The new Grand Prix. Okay, so let me tell you something about Kawasaki right away. Uh, Kawasaki as USA is not releasing the models that are coming to America until January. Okay. Um, they wouldn't confirm or deny what is coming and what isn't coming. Like I was on the phone to them all night in the morning. Going, okay, what are we getting? What are we getting? Because the you know the near, the big thing is at least on the list that I can see. That I think is going to make the biggest impact is the fact that Ninja is now 500, um, but all 400 is now 500. So again, you you see that gradual creep up in terms of capacities. ZX6 we've already spoken about. Um, the Z7 hybrid, uh, I have, haven't ridden that thing. I know that they had a launch of it in Spain a few weeks ago, so interested to see how that works. Don't know enough about it to comment on it, to be honest. Um, ZX4 double R, if that thing, you know, comes out with, with a few little bits and pieces, that'd be fun because I rode Chuck Graves' uh, heavily breathed on 400 at um, Streets of Willow a couple of months ago. And Jesus, that was fun. I saw the video uh, on YouTube. <laughs> that was a laugh, man. I haven't had that much fun on a bike in a long time. Yeah, It you looked know. like you came out on cold tires and within half a lap you were already passing people. It was so easy to ride. Um, I mean, it's stiff as a board, um, which is typical Chuck. You know, I mean, he's race bike to the core. Um, but take a look, you know, if you soften it up a little bit, it's fine. But man, that thing had um, Dunlop Q5s on it. It was the first time I'd ridden on Dunlop Q5s. And I've, you know, as everybody knows, I've been Pirelli guy for, for so many years. And, and, then I got on these Q5s, I was like, man, these are really good tires. Like Dunlop did a really, really good job with those tires. And, and um, yeah, that tire, the tire on that bike, I think it done five track days um, already. So shows how much you can get out of it. I mean, look, $26,000 for one of those things. It's well, a lot of bikes are 26 grand. And don't know how many people are going to be going throwing that at 400, but it is a insanely fun thing that Chuck had built. And, um, but the ZX4 as a base model itself is a really, really good bike. It's very cramped, though. It's very short, tiny, and not like, quite difficult to ride. T- difficult to tuck in if you're, if you're over six foot. But a really, really good bike. The the series to watch actually next year, which is going to be really, really cool, is the British Superbike Championship. It's got a ZX4 one-make championship. 
um, that runs alongside at every round next year. And I've already spoken to a couple of people in Moto America. I'm like, so when are we going to do that? Because that's what I think we're missing is a one make series like that. The, the best championship, I still think the best championship we've had for a long time was that RC390 Cup a few years ago where they're all on the same bikes. I guess you could almost argue that the Junior Cup is that anyway because everyone's on Kawasaki 400s anyway. But it was cool to see them all on exactly one make of bike and just go for it. So I hope in a few years' time we'll see a new ZX4 Cup, but we'll see. So when are they going to hire a... When are they going to hire a designer? Because that <laughs> air scoop above the headlights is just, I don't think that's how God intended bikes to be done. <laughs> yeah, they just decided to flip it. <laughs> you just insulted someone in Japan. I mean, who, what kind of idea was that? It, it just does not look good. I can't, I try to get myself used to it. And I'm like, okay, there's, you know, they're good bikes. Don't be like this. And uh, hey, look, you know. if you're looking at the front end of that while you're riding, then you, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> or you're doing a stand-up wheelie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in Japan, engineers come first and designers come second. Or sometimes oh, not at all. At all I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. KTM. Oh, I have to say, Yamaha did a good job with the, uh, you know, the 600 at the time and, and the R1. Oh, that yeah. was good design. The R1 was gorgeous. Bikes. Yeah, the gor- yeah, I had a, yeah. I had a 2004 yeah. R1. It was gorgeous. Right, okay. KTM 990, they just keep coming up with those weird numbers and weird shapes. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about KTM because Nabil's got one. But um, I love KTMs. I always love them. I think yeah, exactly. Because they're, they're, they're great motorcycles. And, and the 390s. Beautifully ugly. The 390s, especially. I mean, the, the engine just lasts forever, like all day. Yeah, they're great bikes. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible when you consider, um, yeah, you know, it's incredible when you consider the the leap that those things have made. That KTM as a street bike brand in general, how good they've gotten in the last five years. I mean, like three ninety aside, I mean, they were you know three nines were just they were just ring to death, so they just kind of fell apart around you. But like the the bikes like the seven ninety, the eight ninety, the twelve ninety. I mean, like. I'd defy anybody to hop on a 12 and not come back just going, man, that was freaking cool. Uh, they're just big, stupid wheelie machines. <laughs> they're awesome fun. Um, but the new 990 is not actually, I mean, yeah, it is very different. Let me, let me say, but I was going to say, it doesn't actually produce much more power than the old 890 does. And it's not 990, it's 947cc. So the. Because I, I was just on the phone yesterday to the guys at Kramer in, in North Dakota who obviously are running 890s in their new 890RR, which is by far the best one you can buy if you like track riding. Um, but that's just me. <laughs> um, the 890RR and the new, the thing pumps out like 138 horsepower, but it's got you know, titanium rods, pistons, CNC heads, and whatever. But whereas the new 990 is a top to bottom uh, rebuild, different in in a way, and it basically, but it still produces pretty much the same horsepower, but it does it with less emissions. So and then, again, this is this is why they keep getting bigger every time. It's emissions. It's not because they want to build a 990. It's they right. have to build a 990 to be able to get these things through. So um, yeah, you, Euro Five dictates everything that KTM does, and no doubt they will have been briefed on what the next version of it is you're six seven eight ten twelve forty two you know they'll probably have this thing built to the next three iterations of it and then after that it'll probably be a 1090 or whatever it is i don't know but the, that's the reason that the 990 exists it doesn't exist because they didn't like the 890 it's just to get it through emissions and, and we get the benefit when we put that uh, electronics kit on it and the exhaust we just get more power yeah i mean like that 890 that 890 juke especially the 890 juke car far out that's cool like that is so that's absolutely one of my favorite bikes you can buy like i rode it i think a year and a half ago or something or other and i just this thing's so cool like it sounds awesome it's light it's nimble it breaks so well like it turns great it's got 
enough horsepower, 120 horsepower, whatever it is, that's more than enough, um, especially for a street bike. See, so if you can, you can pull stand up wheelies for the next five miles on one of those things, no worries. And yeah, I mean, it's a, it's different to something like a 1290, which is going to become a 1390, um, for next year. Um, which coincidentally, yeah, it's interesting that we haven't seen that from, from, uh, KTM, but I think what's going to happen is, it's going to end up being a 2025 model that's going to get released early. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'm hearing at least. But, yeah, the, the, the 990s, are, or sorry, the 890s are such a good buy. And that's the other thing. Just because this new eight, no, new 990s come out, don't think the old 890 is no good. It is just as good as it always was. It's All such right. a great bike. And they're going to be cheaper now because the 990s come out. They're still seven. They're still selling the seven ninety, right? Yeah, but that's lower spec suspension and bits and pieces. Okay. Did they update the eight ninety engine? Because then in the uh, twenty three KTM RC eight C, they put a different engine with uh, I think it has titanium rods and some yep. other modification that cranks another like eight or ten horsepower. Yeah, uh, the is the RC eight C. Yeah, the RC eight C has got the same motor as the. 890 double R Kramer, which has got titanium rods, uh, titanium, uh, forged, forged piston, CNC heads, titanium inlet and exhaust valves, different cams, higher, higher lift, longer duration cams, different intake, same crank, same, uh, gearbox as an 890, uh, as a base model 890. Although you can with the rc 8 and the 8 double R, um, you can buy a Nova. Uh, close ratio gearbox that they're racing at uh, the TT and sidecar class, also the British Super Sport Championship where they have the GP2 racing. Um, they are all, uh, you can run the close ratio box and that stuff. So if you really want to, which that's the weak point of the bike is the, uh, of the rc 8 c and the, and the 890RR is the gearbox. Uh, everything else is so built up. I mean, when we rode it at, I uh, raced at Barber Vintage Festival a couple of weeks ago, the new 890 double R Kramer. We, we geared it so that we didn't use six gear because the gearbox, uh, the six gear is basically an overdrive. So we only use, I think we didn't even get out of fourth gear, probably enough. Like we gear it right because it has so much torque that you don't need to rev the things at the moment. So, which was actually a lot of fun because it's less work for the rider. Um, but yeah, they, they are a base model 890 engine but heavily heavily agreed upon for those right bikes okay so they did change the internals i thought it was a stock um engine that they new no. stock engine. no the the old 890r craver the first edition 890r craver it's a stock engine yeah. got it so what's the deal with ktm and fairings i mean they, just, <laughs> <laughs> they killed the rc r oh, no. 10 years ago and they're like we're not doing this anymore Except for the RC8C, I mean, you almost want to think take a twelve ninety Duke and put a fairing on it and make it a race bike. Yeah, I think they so just their hand was forced more than anything, especially when you're building a very very competitive MotoGP bike, and then people are like, "Well, why haven't they got any sports bikes?" Um, I can understand them not producing a super bike like they already have a MotoGP bike, um, so that's cool. Um, yeah, it's almost like Kawasaki. Not producing a MotoGP bike anymore, but they have a super bike. So I can I can see that style of thinking. But you also have a, a RC three ninety, which is a sports bike. So where do they go? You know, if you're a sports bike guy and you don't want to have a naked bike, what are you gonna do? So, you know, in the next couple of years you will see that super sport bike come out. Um, I know they're working on it. They've been working on it for a long time. Um this new 990 is going to be out this year and then it's probably going to be the next year. I've already, I've seen spy photos this thing for the last like two years. Um, so that'll come out and that'll at least give a, an area for the riders to be able to stay within the KTM fold. Um, but it is strange. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand why they got rid of the eighth, the RC8, RC8R. I mean, like that chassis was one of the best superbike chassis built in the last 20 years. Engine was a shitbox, but the, the actual chassis itself was fantastic. Like if they put the twelve ninety motor in that, holy smokes! But you need to right. you need to change a lot of things. You know, you couldn't run that gearbox. You'd have to change a bunch of stuff. But like 
that's the one problem with the 12 9 is a big heavy engine but there's no reason that you couldn't make it work in a super bike something like that like it's a it was, and, and chuck it in an eight and an rc8r oh, yeah rc8r cross over yes. like, yeah that's one throw it in that chassis <laughs> and you'd have a kick-ass bike i think a few people have actually done it just as like home projects and things like that but yeah it's a i do i do uh miss riding those bikes as they were cool and different and quirky and look cool and I, I think I heard I heard rumors that their CEO said one time that superbikes are way too dangerous and that's why they're not making them. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Sounds that's right. right. So yeah, uh, yeah, but I mean, you make it you make it naked twelve ninety. I don't see the difference. You're gonna kill yourself either way. No. no I mean, <laughs> Christ, I raced those. I raced uh, two. Two of my four pike speed bikes were. Actually, no, I raced the 2015, 2017 in 16, 17, and 18 for Pikes Peak. So when my first time I raced Pikes Peak, I had a 15 uh, Super Duke, and then and we threw, like, all the power parts at it and everything. And, like, that thing was an animal. Like, I'll tell you, like, it had the world's shortest gearing. It was just a freaking monster of a bike. And then we... Uh, got the 17 and then I raced that in 17 and 18 and then in 19 I jumped on the Acrylia but like those things were quick as hell I mean like Chris Fillmore on that thing and Chuck Waller was doing 48 something and it's wow. a naked bike and people were like what the hell like it was it was awesome to watch <laughs> so yeah I don't understand the theory of not running fairies it's, you know you, you make the fastest naked bike in the world it's make a difference you know what I you know what I, I want to see? Especially if you're investing in a MotoGP bike. You know what I want to see? MotoGP team, I should say. Remember when Ducati sold their MotoGP bike uh, for the road? I forget. Desmo Sedici, is that what it was? Desmo Sedici. Yeah, I want yeah. to see. Yeah, KTM very nearly did that. Yeah. And they pulled the pin on it, which was a real bummer. Oh. Yeah. That, that would, Meaning that developing cool. the actual commercial version of a MotoGP bike or just selling their yeah. old No, no, they were, they were going to build... A, they were going to build and sell a production, almost like a KTM version of the RCA, uh, RC 213V uh, S or whatever it is, or right. the Desmond Zedici. They were going to do that. And that was back in, say, about 2018, 2019, maybe. It was right at the time when the MotoGP project launched. Um, maybe after the first year or so, they were, they were going to build a production version of it, but they all got squashed. Too bad. Mm-hmm. That would be a yeah. that would be a great bike to have. Yeah, yeah. Investment piece that one. Yeah. Next one on the list. Okay, your favorite brand, gal. Uh, <laughs> New favorite brand, I should say. Well, I I got a phone call from the from uh, the movie company today that that the driver is almost here, but I I'm getting my uh, my new Bimota, but Bimota all of a sudden produced a I don't know crossover. Uh, touring, I don't know what to call it, but uh, the new Terra, which uh, yeah. which has that that same or it looks it looks a little newer uh, version of that that Tezzy front suspension, whatever whatever they have going on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what what do you know about that that bike? Probably not a lot. I mean, because... Not a lot other than it's like utterly bonkers because it has the H two. Um, supercharged engine in it um it's basically uh you can almost look at this as being as the motors version of an s1000xr um like we were talking about with the the uh what do you call it? gsx s x plus 1000 minus two whatever it is that they call it um plus but yeah the the tessie um sorry not the tessie the the terra i should say um, it does look typically garish remoter you know out there style um i mean i, I personally love the motors i've always had a soft spot for them um, especially like the early late 90s early 2000s promoters like when anthony gobert was racing those things i just love those bikes but yeah the i don't i gotta say i don't know enough about this bike i've only ever seen photos of it so um i'll have to reserve judgment on it i'm sure it is going to be um very like exceedingly quick i'm sure it's going to be equally as 
a pain in the ass to buy in America. Uh, I know a guy. Motors. I know a guy. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. His, so name, I, his I name's hope, Bob. I know a guy. Right. Well, then I hope that, I hope that Bob gets out there and, and gets these things going because I've only ever seen one for sale, one promoter for sale in, in the States, which was at Iconic Motorcycles, motor, Iconic Motorbikes in Santa, Santa Monica, which was the, the H2 Superbike version which was just the best sounding bike I think I've ever heard far out. That was so cool. And they are such brilliant bikes, but I mean, like with you, your bike, um, what'd you get again? What was it? Uh, again? KB4. Yeah, the KB4. Like that's a beautiful bike. Like it's a really lovely little motorcycle. And, and that's what these things are, you know, like the motors are artworks. They always have been. And, you know, if you look at a DB8, Promoter, like I remember when that thing came out, and we were testing it back to back with the 1198 Ducati, uh, which it was based off. It in every way was a worse motorcycle. Like in every way, it was a worse motorcycle. But I would have taken the DVA just because it looked better. Like it was the Ducati ran rings around it, but the, the motor just there's just something about it, man. They're just beautiful bikes, and they're just quirky, and different, and yeah, you, know, you see a guy with a promoter, you're like, yeah, all right, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Next one is Ducati, and uh, you remember the Supermoto from the '90s? Well, they came up with another one, right? Or just the engine, a single cylinder, and then they stuffed it inside a Supermoto bike, which looks motor, yeah. Which looks pretty good. Kind of fun bike to ride. Yeah, it looks pretty good. I rode, yeah. a, I rode a regular Hyper with whatever, 890 or whatever engine they had in there. 790, I think it was the small one. Probably the most fun bike to ride on the street that I've ever ridden. Oh, yeah. So this thing They're must awesome. be a blast. Yeah, this thing, like, unless you have got the, the self-control of a monk, you're probably going to lose your license on it. Because um, <laughs> yeah. I, if I just got that, I'm switching everything off, and I'm spending as much time on the back wheel, and then on the front wheel, and then the back wheel, and then sliding it into corners, and just acting like a complete buffoon. The it's absolutely my style of bike. That I mean, I second your your quote on the hyper motard. I had a 950 hyper motard, and just loved it. Like, God, it was so much fun, and surprisingly useful as well. Not not as big a bike is what kind of looks whereas this thing just looks like you know this looks like pouring acid on your driver's license <laughs> yeah i think you can get uh you can get bags for that thing right yeah you can yeah so i mean uh, it's right interesting commuter bike commuter it's interesting bike. with this thing it's like i mean this is a, a single that revs 10,000 rpm 10,250 rpm like 77 horsepower they're getting out of this thing i mean i don't I suppose when was the last time a single rev to 10,000 RPM. Like, like, that's wild. So, it's, I mean, it's going to be a very, very popular bike, I think. Um, and it's priced pretty well, too. I mean, the, the base model is 12,995, 12, whereas the RVE edition, that's 14,495. So, you know, you obviously you get your little little bits and pieces that you get your add-ons and things of there. But it does look like a good fun. Like a big old supermoto, very much like the the KTM uh, 690 Husqvarna 701, that kind of style. Um, that's kind of who they're going after. And as we all know, KTM and, uh, and uh, KTM and Ducati are the best of friends. So yeah i think that's the only reason why this bike exists is so that ktm could put another so that so that Ducati can put another one up ktm <laughs> are you planning a comparison in, in cycle news between those two 100 oh, percent. okay absolutely <laughs> as soon as i get them i'm doing it <laughs> uh and then for the people that have too much money um i, I suggest an index fund but if you're a moron you can buy the Pentagala v4 sp2 30th anniversario 916 which just means that you're getting a different paid job and a few more carbon parts is that what you it is what do you have against a new set of stickers i don't understand and a new set of stickers you know the stupid thing about that motorcycle 
that it doesn't even look like a nine one six. Like <laughs> if you were to if you were to go and buy that thing, I would want the same graphics as a nine one six. Like the most iconic looking Ducati of all time. Why couldn't they just have Panigale V four written like as a you know the slant writing that they had for Ducati nine one six on the font? original bike? Yeah. And they looked at this and I'm like, it doesn't have anything to do with the nine one six. Just says nine one six. I was like, what? What happened? Uh, I don't think. No, no. I don't think. Uh, du- I don't okay. think Ducati people would actually care. They'll buy it. They will. They'll buy it. Um, but it is frustrating because it's just like, man, you <laughs> you could have bought back the legend and instead you just stuck a bloody sticker on the side of it. <laughs> Yeah, they. I think they missed the mark too. Absolutely. There's that period has specific Ducati graphics and font and logos. You, you know that's this going to be on YouTube too, right? <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he tried. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's still though the, the V4 just out of the box. If you wanted to buy a race bike. And not do anything to it. Yeah, you, it's pretty much out of the box. You mean like riding it? <laughs> well, yeah, if you wanted a good track bike that needs nothing, a lot of racers will tell you that's as good as they come, without spending ton of money on top of it. Because if you think about it, you buy a R6 and you spend another fifteen grand doing stuff to it. By the time you get it right. Or, then the, the mm-hmm. prices start making sense. I don't know about the SP2. Now you're kind of, you know, all these special edition, but like a nice base V4 or V4S, as good as they come. Mm. With the X10R2 to an extent. Mm. Um, yeah, the S1000, M1000. I have not ridden uh, the new M1000, obviously. Um, but the S1000, I think, is just the one of the best bikes out there. I love that thing. I had one for, I had one of the first generation bikes for about nearly two years. Um, I think it was 2016, 17 or so I had one. I put so many miles on that thing. I just loved it. Um, and we had the latest one, I think it was about a year or two ago at Cycle News. We had it for about six months or so. I've always been a big fan of those things. I mean, I grew up in Australia around big naked bikes and things like that. Um, but the, these things, you know, for me, are the most applicable bikes now out there. And, you know, we go right back to the beginning of the show when we talk about that new GSX Suzuki that's coming out. You know, these bikes now, they, they can do absolutely everything. And that's why the Monster Strider is so good as well, like the Monster V4S. My favorite bike, it's incidentally, but none on the street right now, is a bike speak Monster Strider. Like, Give me one of those, and I'll be happy for the rest of my life. I just think that bike's so good. You know what? They, they came the, up. They came up with an RS RS now. Yeah, right? I, I think I forgot it. I forgot to put it on the list. But they they stuck a different engine in there. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. So that that was released before Ica, though. That yeah. Was a yeah, month or so before Ica. Yeah, yeah. That one's that one's gonna be wild. Like I know Troy Sahan that motorcycle.com's written it, and he was just like, man, this thing's nuts. And then, um. But you know, back to the back to BMW. It's that those are the, the Swiss Army bikes now, Swiss Army knife bikes uh, of the motorcycle world. Like they can do absolutely everything that requires a, a tar road underneath. You can take it to the track. You can go quick. You can throw bags on it. You can tow it to, from here to the other side of the country in complete comfort. Like fantastic bikes. So. Obviously, the M1000 XR is a much more focused bike. Uh, carbon fiber bits dripping off the thing. It looks just mag- magnificent. Um, yeah, re- they're going to be really, really cool. Um, I had the M1000R, the naked bike, in here the other week. Um, I had that for about, uh, I don't know, six weeks or other. And at least three times, I came downstairs. And this is a true story. I came downstairs looking for my boy, and he was sitting in the garage on that bike because he loved it so much. And I was like, what the hell? No, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, this thing's so cool. And he's like looking at the wings and all this stuff. And, and so, I mean, obviously, if a six-year-old is completely obsessed with it, they're obviously doing something right with those with those M-bikes. But, you know, carbon wheels, all that stuff, man, like 
I, I'm such a sucker for carbon pedals. Like, if you, if anybody out there is thinking about putting a modification on their bike, don't put an exhaust on your bike. Go put some light wheels on it, and that's when you, that's when you get the street cred. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the next bike is iconic. The GS. They made it thirteen hundred. Yeah. yeah, I just rode that bike over in Spain. Um, got back from Malaga a couple. Well, we put over a week ago. It's bloody good. Got to say, like straight up, hand on heart, it is a really damn good bike. Um, it was, I mean, look, they're always good bikes, but it's extremely different compared to what it was. Uh, it's a lot smaller, front to rear, top to bottom. It's a lot more compact. Seat angle is different. The bar position is different. The engine's more compact. The front suspension is completely different. The rear suspension is completely The whole thing's different, but it's... I guess it's one of those things. It's like same, same, but different. Like it's all optimized. It's all shrunk down a lot more. The frame is is very different. Um, the sheet metal construction frame with a cast, uh, a cast aluminum subframe, which has just never been seen before on GSs. It's got that new Evo telelever front suspension where it's done away with a couple of the ball joints and now runs flex plates at the back in between the steering heads um, or below the steering heads, to say, uh, which takes out... Uh, you know, obviously a lot of weight, a lot of friction. I took that thing up some pretty awful, um, shaly kind of rocky, crappy roads in Spain, and the thing just trucks so well off-road. Um, on-road, they're always really good, and it's not as big a difference on-road as it is off-road, in my opinion. Um, the smaller ergonomics will suit more people, I think, because especially when you started looking at things like GS trophies, GS benches, things like that, they're big bikes. And they're now we rode the, the standard one and the trophy. There's not that much of a difference between the two of them now. Uh, yeah, but they're fantastic bikes. The electronics are completely redone. Um, there's just like talk to you for hours on this thing. Um, but this is the way the GS is now going to be for a good while. Um, this 1300 has been in development since 20, end of 2017 is when they started development and they bought the latest 1250 out in 2018. So they're already, they already leapfrogged themselves in terms of the development. It's a really, really, really good bike. Um, still, they're always one of my favorites. It still is. It's, I can't speak highly enough, but it's awesome. And they sell a lot of them. They do. It's, a, yeah. it's that thing of like stereotypes exist for a reason and it's, you know, that many people can't be wrong. Like, I, I rode a GS. The first time I rode a GS, I was 14 in Australia. And it was, I had fun on it back then. You know, it was just when, when dad saw I was old enough to be able to st stand upright on it, he goes, off you go. And I went, all right, cool. <laughs> Ripped it around a, a dirt road for a bit. It's great fun. But yeah, they are such good bikes. So versatile to do anything on them. More so, almost than you can with an XR, but an XR, at least with a GS, you can take it off right. Can't do that with an XR. Yeah. Next one is uh, the Aprilia RS four uh, five seven. Now, Aprilia are known for their RSV fours, a thousand, eleven hundred, and they're also known for the one twenty fives, the the RS two stroke one twenty fives. Yep. Uh, and and now they stuck something in in between. Yep. Yeah, so although they've been been interesting for for them to to be coming out with a four five seven, um, I don't really know why that is why that's the way they they did it, but I don't know. It's it's going to be. I mean, look, it's a, it's an Aprilia sports motorcycle. It's going to be good. They always are. Um, you know, they've. I can't think of any. I mean, my my. The favorite bike I've ever owned, aside from my Asfana Supermoto, was my RS250 Aprilia back in Australia, um, the two stroke. And they've just, that's where the company does its best work is in sports chassis. Um, always have done. So, you know, if you're, I mean, you owned an RS before and, you know, the fantastic bike. I raced the Tawano again. Other great bike. I can't, can't lie about it. They're going to be good. Um, I'd be interested to see how it's going to be. How it's going to go as far as racing, but with the Ninja now being a 500, whether we get that in America or not, I know that because of Aprilia being in um, Twins Cup racing 
in, in the States for, for a number of years, and that being a 660. Uh, I don't think they'll have any dramas with getting them in Total America, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be at least half the pack that's going to jump from a Ninja 400 onto one of these things. So um, I'm sure it's going to be a, a really, really good bike. I mean, they're, they're talking, what, 350 pounds dry for that thing, so you can probably make a 365 ready to go. Which not bad, and then when you start throwing, you start taking all the bits and pieces off the underneath the street. You might get that thing down to just over three hundred kilo, three hundred pounds ready to rock. So yeah. it'll be all the bike. And if they're gonna have a trophy version like the six sixty, it's even gonna be better. Probably they will. I would I would suggest that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it really tends to do that with most of their sports stuff. Next one is um, a sister company for Aprilia, same dash. <laughs> The Moto Guzzi, oh, the Moto Guzzi Stelvio. Uh, now yeah, this, I'm really looking forward to this. I, are they going uh, to launch it in the Stelvio Pass? I bloody hope so. <laughs> That'd be great. It's funny, like I, I actually emailed Shane at Aprilia and I said, "Where are we riding this thing?" He wrote back, "Venice Beach." What? Like, Take like, uh, count me out. I'm like, get out, oh, get out of here. Get no, right, no, gotta ride the Stelvio and Stelvio. Yeah, yeah, they better be doing it. It's a bloody Stelvio Pass, but. <laughs> Who knows? Um, I, I've, I've, I had a lot of experience on the old Stelvio, you know, the old 1200 Stelvio back in the day. Tank of a bike. Like, just really big, heavy. Not that, not a bad bike, but just a real gnarly bike kind of thing. Um, and uh, wife's calling me. Um, yeah, it was just a, you know, big old thing. So, um in the end, uh, they've done a good job as far as redesigning everything goes, um, making sure everything is as small as it can be now with the way that many motorcycles are going, where there's a lot of wasted space on those old bikes. But you know, it takes a lot of what the V100 Mandelo was, the you know, same engine and bits and pieces here and there, like different chassis, different drive shaft, but pretty much the same electronics, uh, different ride position and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a good bike to add. I think that'll be... Bit of a surprise. The next bike uh, is one of Nabil's favorites, if not the favorite, right? You're, you're the MV boy here, Nabil? Our second favorite brand. Second it's favorite the brand. KTM. Oh, okay. After the KTM. So uh, remember the 90s, uh, the Lucky Strike Kajivas? Well, uh, MV Augusta came up with something similar. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have the Lucky Strike logo, but it's got like half of it. Uh, what do you think about that new, uh, what's it called, Oriali? Oriali. Um, so that is, uh, what's the guy's first name? No, Eddie. So, yeah, it's named after Eddie Ari- Eddie Orioli, who is the Italian Dakar racer. He won the race, won the race four times back when it was a real Dakar. Um, you know, two weeks, three weeks, so usually like length of Africa kind of stuff. Uh, guy is an absolute off-road legend, um, but you know he back in the day, as you say, he rode for Kajiba with the uh, Elephant, uh, which was owned by Ducati, but they were that back that look. Sorry, I'm tripping over my and words here. Back then, Ducati was owned by the Castiglione brothers, who then went off and bought MV Augusta. So if you can if you follow follow along on that body. Um, yeah, you know, Italian comedy that, that that stuff is, but um, yeah. So Eddie Eddie Ariola gets the uh, gets his own tribute motorcycle, which he thoroughly deserves. I mean, if you ever see those those photos of the Kajiba elephants back in the day, I mean, man, that was when men were men back then. Like those are serious bikes, and uh, so yeah, he's he's got this thing. It is going to be crazy expensive, um, probably north of thirty two grand, I would think for. For an, a, a Luxo adventure bike, whatever you want to call it, um, I've I've often had a bit of an issue with MV Augusta and their pricing. I think that, that's a that's an argument for another day. Um, but it's gonna it's look it should be a, it should be a good bike. Um, they I think I think they're limited too actually. Um, Are they? Nabil, just, Nabil, hurry up and put your order in. I'm actually looking real quick here. Yeah, no, I don't think you want an MV for something where you're going to be 500 miles away from a dealer. Yeah, 
I would. Yeah, here we go. Limited to 500 editions. Wait, you... uh, I mean, look, it does look bitching. Like it's it's a it does look very close to what his bike was, like a modern interpretation of what his bike was. Um, you know, especially when you get silver wheels, like the old '90s style uh, alloy wheels, and uh, looks looks really really good. Um, you know, big like exposed uh, um, tubular subframe and things like that. But uh, yeah, I tend to agree. You know, probably want to be a bit careful on some of that. But it does cost. It's going to cost so much that most most people are going to, if they ride it, they're going to ride it at Starbucks. <laughs> let's let's be honest. But it will. This will be a bit like the uh, MV Tamburini and things like that, where it's like the the halo bike, and then there's the the trickle the trickle down from there onwards. But yeah, you know, in nine thirty one cc in line triple counter rotating crank like they've had forever. Um, one hundred twenty four horsepower that MV is claiming out of this thing, and seventy five pounds feet of torque. So yeah, pretty good. Um, not going to set the world on fire as far as you know KTM adventures and uh, BMW GSs and that kind of stuff go. But that's you know really selling to the same customer. I don't think at that point. So going to be a going to be a nice thing. I'd love to see why. It certainly looks nice. Um, but I think they're more of a more of a showpiece than, than what you're going to see as a real hard adventure bike. I mean, it'll probably ride well because you know they have a compact engine, not very heavy. You can do a shorter wheelbase. Um, I'd be interested in trying it actually. It'll be a good bike. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Like it'll be it'll be a nice thing. Um, but as you say, do you want to ride one to the middle of nowhere? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is going to happen to this company? I mean, they, they keep changing hands. I think KTM put money in recently. KTM's right? going to buy it. Yeah. Uh, KTM's going to buy it outright by the end of 2026. So, um, and that's not me telling you something that's not already in the public domain. That's, yeah. um, they, you know, the prior self, Stephen Pira, you know, that guy, he knows what he's doing. Um, he he wouldn't buy a, a mini stake in a company unless he had interests in taking the whole thing over to begin with. I mean, there is talk of uh, MV Augusta coming into MotoGP in 2027 when the new rules come through. And there, it's, there's more, I think there's more truth to that rumour than a lot of people think because, well, I suppose we're going off a little bit on the tangent here, but if you if you look back to the Suzuki coming out of MotoGP, there's two grid spots available. Donna wouldn't give their two grid spots to uh, KTM to put Husqvarna in there because they knew it was just going to be like a rebadged bloody KTM like they did with Gas Gas. They said it has to be a new manufacturer. So the the only people that are even remotely possible as far as coming in as a possibility as a manufacturer is and be Augusta uh, because they have the money behind it, but they have to do it on their own. And by on their own means not a rebadged KTM RC16. So that's what's going to happen is that if, if, if they come in, it's not guaranteed they're going to come in, but you can bet your bottom dollar that within a couple of years, MB Augusta is going to be 100% owned by Pierre Mobility Group. You know, it's like Gas Gas is, like Husqvarna is, uh, all that stuff. So felt bicycles as well, same thing. Yeah, it'd be great for the brand because right now they have almost no dealer network, and yeah, you, uh, yeah. they're good at design. They do. They, I mean, MB Augusta, it's a strange one because like they just can't seem to get out of their own way. Like they, they produce these bikes and they sell them, which is I find it nuts. Like the, then again, what do I know? I don't have enough money to buy them. But like they, every bike that they were producing was a limited edition. And almost to a point where a limited edition doesn't become it doesn't become special anymore. So, in the end, like, look, I get it. Like, you know, you want to um, you want to have something cool. I mean, I still think the most beautiful motorcycle I think I've ever seen is that MB Augusta LH44 Lewis Hamilton Superbike from about five six years oh, yeah. ago. Like, that was like, seven, like, seventy something. Oh, that is stunning. Was it seventy yeah. seventy grand or something like that? Seventy two. Like yeah. I mean, look, it's yeah, just an FRC. The red carbon fiber and gold. Oh, beautiful bike. Man, you see one of those things in person, you're like, oh, that is hot. 
But that's just an FRRC for the fancy paint shop. But shit, I'd buy one if I had the money just to look at it. But the they can't keep doing that. You can't just keep making little one-off things. Like, yeah, you can make yourself a premium brand, but I almost look at MV Augusta like maybe a bit like Aston Martin in a way. Like there's you can kind of draw parallels with them in that regard. They really need to get back to top level racing, in my opinion, because they are one of the original great companies that went racing and dominated for so long. They they need to be back in MotoGP, I think. I think that's the premium racing series. It's a premium brand. It's you know yeah. how we yeah, you get what I mean. But I really hope they do get their deal and it works sorted out because they do have good products. Like that F four eight hundred that you've got, awesome bike. Like fantastic bike. Um the what do you call it the Brutale 1000s no thank you not for me um i think they are way overpriced for what they are uh, like and not just a little bit overpriced i think they are highway robbery overpriced um especially when you can go and buy a you know v4 sp buddy street fighter for 10 grand less or no, 10 grand, whatever, that has great deal of support, that has better components on it. You know, you can't just bank off the name just because it's an MV Augusta and put 10, 10 grand on it. You've got to give the people value for money. So the base model of that, if they took 10 grand off that off that uh, Brutale, especially the, the lower spec one, the one with the higher handlebars, I remember it's the R of the RS, um, if they took the 10 grand off it, then it becomes a viable option. It's like, yeah, okay, it's a bit more premium than than something like a any of the Japanese fours or even a KTM twelve ninety um, Super Duke. A little bit different, but you can't go charging thirty five thousand bucks for those things. That's just that's just rude. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. To your point, you should be winning races. I I do think they do design very well. If you look at the details of these bikes, um, I think that's what a lot of people pay for. And you're not going to, you know, it's going to ride pretty much as well as another bike, not not that much better. But the detail in the design is unbelievable. And not, yeah. not the F3 and the F4s, but, you know, the special editions, the Brutale has, especially when you go into their special editions too, they got unbelievable design detail that's really pretty to look at. Yeah, they do a good job. I mean, the, that CRC design house that they have um, in Verizzi, yeah, they they do a brilliant job of making the things look very nice. And, you know, they, if you look at like that MV Augusta uh, Brutale on oh no, a Dragster 800 America, you know, I mean, I, I had, I did the launch of that six months ago, or whatever it was. I mean, mm-hmm. like brilliant looking guy, awesome looking guy, not the best thing to ride by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but a beautiful looking motorcycle, like far out. Like that's one of the bikes that you would stick it in your living room and just look at it. And that's kind of been MV's thing. They don't produce ugly motorcycles. I mean, the the F4, until it stopped being produced, looked pretty much the same as it did from when Tamburini first took the wraps off it in 1996 for the, 90, for the 97 model year. Like, it, all the way through, you know, they, they hit the nail on the head so hard that they realised they didn't have to change it. And that's the same thing with a lot of those bikes. They don't, they never differ a lot. I mean, like that, and I'm looking at the photo now that are Orioli bike. That's a bloody good looking motorcycle. Like, if they can make the thing when the new one comes, well, when the, the one that mere mortals can afford to buy and want to go riding, if they make the thing good and they make it reliable and everything and they have a good deal on network, then yeah, they can be a big player. There's no reason they shouldn't be a big player. They're commanding the kind of money of big players. So they should, you should get this. If you get, you know, you buy the fruit, you should be able to get the bowl that goes with it. Yeah. Well said. I, I think a part well part said. of their yeah. initial success with the 750 was uh, the 999. Did that? Tamarini came came off of designing the 996, and then he went to MV and he did the F4. In the meantime, they hired Pierre Tablage, and uh, yeah, he kind of made the he made the 999. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, from it went from one of the best looking motorcycles ever to one of the worst motorcycles ever. And now, have you seen one of them now though like no. i would take one of those things any day that's one of the best aging motorcycles ever i didn't see one for years and then i saw them at the 
Barber Vintage Festival a couple of weeks ago, I was like, God damn, that looks good now. Like, <laughs> I think it looks yeah. awesome. <laughs> I don't know why people don't like them. I, that was the first bike that caught my eye in the Ducati lineup. I'm like, oh, what is a Ducati? And I saw this, and I'm like, I got to look at this brand. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful looking thing now. I mean, just I think it wasn't successful because it was a going up against the best looking bike that's ever been built in a 916. Like, yeah. To be honest, it's, um, but now it's had time to stand on its own legs. And it's a gorgeous bike, that thing. Like, really lovely. Okay. I agree. So I'm I'm glad oh, we we've gone around the world here. Yeah, I'm I'm glad we we only did that thing in one hour because we try to keep our podcasts in one hour. So so I'm did glad. Well, on that one. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm we glad. consistently <laughs> fail. <laughs> <laughs> we always fail. Well, the problem is we talk to very interesting people that know a lot about the industry because because we're lucky and they're generous with their time, and ends up taking forever. And you could have another two and a half hours on the back of this and keep talking. So, yeah. Th so thank, thank you so much, Randy, yeah. for being so generous with us. Uh, yeah, thanks for having us on, guys. I really appreciate it. It was a good chat. And and go check out Cycle News on CycleNews.com. You can go and you guys have, I think, the best format because it's a combination of print and videos. So you can actually go through an online print magazine like like you would do on any other publication, but you embed videos in it. So uh, it's not yeah. like it's not like reading a magazine. It's it's reading a magazine plus looking at videos. Which is yeah, it's kind of an interactive magazine in a way, I guess. Yeah, which I think is is the best uh, the best online version of consuming motorcycle content that I saw. So right, uh, thank you. everybody should Absolutely. go. Yeah, everybody should go check out uh, Cycle News and and thank you, Randy, for your time. And we'll see you in Chakwala. Yeah, it. and if Randy, by the way, goes to TT again. I think we should create a fan club and fly over there with him. Yeah. <laughs> Just support from the fad lines. Yeah. Uh, that sounds uh, good. Yeah. Start a GoFundMe and we might talk about it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you guys for listening.